Okay, so if I can just take the, the sedent by roll call. Um, the following members are present. <coughs> Councillors Allison, Bradley, Buchanan, Callahan, Cowie, Craig, Devlin, Donnelly, Dorman, Dryborough, Hamilton. Uh, Councillor Ian Harrow. Yep. Yep. Uh, Councillor Horsham's present. Councillor Anne LeBlond. Here. Councillors Lennon and Lockhart are present. Councillor Law. Apologies. Councillor McLaughlin's present. Councillor Lynn Nalen. Here. Councillor Nugent is present. Councillor John Ross. Councillor Scott is present. Councillor David Shearer. Councillor Shearer will probably not be here. Just had an email. Thank you. I have apologies from Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Thompson and Councillor Wattaw are present. I um, understand Councillor Faulkner is present. Councillor Faulkner, can I just confirm, are you here as a substitute or are you observing? Observing. Observing. OK, thank you. Hey, thank you. I will now pass you back to the chair for today's business. Thank you, Stuart. Do you have any declarations of interest? Could we agree the minutes of the previous meeting in pages five to eight? Agreed, Chair. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Moving on to agenda item three, that's application hearing P201365. And that's in pages nine to 30. And I'd like to invite the applicants to introduce themselves. Good morning, that be myself. My name is Lynn Sherry. I'm one of the heads of education at Education Resources and I've got responsibility for support services in the school estate. I have two other colleagues with me here today, which are Mora McDonald, who is our um, early years and childcare manager, and also Van Sinclair, who is our partnership development manager and, and who was responsible, as you will know, from the school's modernisation programme, the primary school's modernisation programme, and has been involved in the 1140 hours rollout as well. Thank you, Lynn. I'd like to invite the objectors to introduce themselves. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael McLaughlin and I live in Blantyre Mill Road in Bothwell and uh, I will be the first of the, the three objectors to speak. Mr Budge, your microphone's on mute. Yeah, sorry about that. Good morning. Uh, so I'm David Budge. I live about 300 metres away from the Clyde Terrace site. Good morning, everyone. My name's Joanna and I live in Clyde Terrace. I'm actually on the street that the proposed nursery is. Thank you. I'd like to invite Bernard to take us through the report, please, Bernard. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I'll run, just to be clear, I'll run through part of the presentation before handing back to the Chair to allow the hearing to take place, whereby the applicant and objectors will be allowed to address the committee. Thereafter, I will conclude the presentation. Planning permission is sought for the erection of a children's nursery and associated works on vacant land located to the west of Clyde Terrace, Bothwell. The site is located within a residential area and extends to just under 1,700 square metres. There are residential properties to the north and south of the site, with parts of the rear of the site and further open space on the opposite side of Clyde Terrace. The main elements of the proposal relate to the erection of a nursery, formation of on-street parking, and the re relocation of the electricity substation, which is currently on site. The proposed building would be of modern design and comprise single storey and two storey elements. Externally, the building would be finished in a combination of facing brick, render and zinc cladding. Within the site, an external play area would be provided. The nursery would accommodate up to 113 children 
and employ up to 25 staff. The nursery would be open from 8am to 6pm. As part of the proposals, 32 on-street parking spaces would be provided, with six located to the front of the nursery and the other 26 spaces on the opposite side of Clyde Terrace. In terms of the development plan, the site is identified as part of the general urban area within both the adopted and proposed local plan, which reflects the up-to-date views of the Council. A variety of additional policies referenced in section 3.1 of the report are mentioned, and the general aim is to ensure that the development is appropriately designed, located, serviced, and results in no adverse impacts on the surrounding area. In terms of consultation, the responses are summarised in section 4 of the report. There are no objections from consultees, and any matters raised can be addressed through condition. A total of 161 objections are noted in the report as having been submitted, and this includes representations from Councillor Kenny McCreary and Margaret Mitchell, MSP. In addition, a further four objections have been submitted since the report was prepared, which do not raise any matters not covered in the report. A letter was also received yesterday with specific comments on the planning report and the handling of the application. This will be dealt with as a stage two complaint in terms of the Council complaints handling procedures and a separate response will be issued in due course. The main issues raised relate to traffic, parking, relocation of the substation, the impact on the nearby open space, the impact on, of the development on the amenity of the surrounding area, overdevelopment of the site and the general impact on the natural and built environment. As mentioned previously, it has been agreed there will be a hearing for this application and I'll hand you back to the Chair. Thank you, Bernard. I could ask the applicants to present their case, and you have 10 minutes in which to present your case. Thank you. Okay, I'm just. Mr. McLaughlin, you're on. Oh, sorry. I'm just checking everyone can hear me okay? <clears throat> yes, thank yep. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you and good morning everyone. <clears throat> As you will know, the pro proposed facility will support the statutory expansion of nursery provision from 600 hours to 1140 hours per annum for all of our eligible two to five year old children in the geographical area of Bothell and Uddingston. We do recognise that identifying a suitable site in the area has not been without its challenges. <clears throat> Scottish Government funding specifically precluded any funding for the acquisition of land or acquisition or rental property, with the presumption being that we were to sweat our own assets to ensure best value, so the sites considered were restricted to existing council-owned sites. Notwithstanding that, however, over the last two years, a number of privately owned sites were suggested to us, but were either unsuitable or provided challenges in terms of issues such as size or land use, for example, being located within a heavily trafficked industrial area. A review of numerous council-owned sites were undertaken and a proposal was taken forward to build the new nursery at the centre at Appledore Crescent in Bothwell. Following objections to this planning application, further consideration was given to the likely traffic impacts of the development on the Appledore Crescent cul-de-sac, which led to the conclusion that there was merit in the objections received. After this, further consideration on the Clyde Terrace site was undertaken, and the main reason that this site had not originally been taken forward was due to not being able to provide the necessary car parking, which we had traditionally provided from within a site boundary. However, after discussion and review with the Roads and Transportation Services um, team within the Council, it was agreed that in principle, with its wide carriageway and ability to accommodate on-street car parking bays, Clyde Terrace could be an acceptable location for the new nursery. So for us, this brought to life the exciting potential to site the nursery right on the doorstep of Wooddean Park and the Bothwell Nature Trail, which would be an amazing opportunity for the children in terms of their outdoor learning opportunities. We worked with the design team and early year staff to meet the requirements of the nursery while sensitively designing a building which would both appropriately blend into the surrounding natural environment in terms of you know, the choice of external materials, the retention of trees, etc and fit with the neighbouring houses. Again, example, comparative height levels with deliberate efforts to actually only design a partial second storey floor to accommodate staff and management requirements only. In addition, the existing path into Woodine Park, it will remain with the education offering to assist and to fund for some of the new signage at the entrance, for example. 
However, we recognise that a significant number of objections have now been received for Clyde Terrace, primarily from residents of the immediate local area. And we would like to um, take the opportunity now to talk about some of the main um, objections as we see them. The first is about lack of consultation. Although there is no statutory requirement to undertake a public consultation event for a planning application of this scale, Education undertook the same consultation process as we did successfully for the recent primary schools modernisation programme. So in line with that programme, a roadshow event was undertaken in December of 2019 for the nearby residents and the potential users of the proposed facility. We advertised on the council's website, no sorry, the Twitter page, we communicated directly with more than 300 known parents of nursery aged children and the local groups such as the Bothwell Community Council, Brighter Boswell and the Wood Dean Group, they were advised of the roadshow. It ran from three to six and was attended by approximately 75 people over the three hours. People got the opportunity to speak with officers, they reviewed the proposal and the architect was also present. People were then encouraged to complete a card if they had concerns or comments and we received only seven. In addition, preliminary meetings involving local elected members and representatives from Bothwell Community Council, the Wood Dean Group and Brighter Bothwell, they took place on the 9th of October and the 9th of December 2019. After that, Education did agree to hold a further roadshow prior to the submission of a planning application once the detailed plans were available. However, COVID pandemic then struck and public meetings were not permitted at that time. The application was ready for May 2000, but we currently, you know, at that time we were diverted to dealing with COVID and also thought restrictions in public meetings may lift at some point in the future. When by the time we reached October, restrictions had not lifted and noting the limited objections, we moved ahead with the planning application. At this time, Education again wrote to neighbours out with the planning application notification process as well, outlining that the application was being submitted and that um, representations could be made to the Council's planning department. Alternatively, at that point, we also offered anyone wanting to discuss the project to have a virt virtual meeting with us and we gave details on how that could be arranged. No one took us up on this offer. Again, at that time, we communica communicated with more than 300 of our known parents of nursery aid children in the area to let them know of our progression. So we therefore do believe that there was sufficient consultation on the proposal which went above and beyond the statutory requirements. The second area we wanted to touch upon was about traffic congestion and safety. So although again a traffic assessment report is not a statutory requirement for a development of this size, we listened to the objections and we decided to commission a traffic assessment by external consultants to help allay the concerns being expressed and address some of the issues. The independent conclusion reached was that the traffic impacts can be accommodated on the local road network being acceptable in terms of capacity and safety. As we are not traffic experts, we do rely on the Council's roads teams to review the report and assess its competence. And you can see from the committee report here today that they're satisfied that it offers a robust assessment and agree with its conclusion. In order to lay the concerns of the objectors, we will implement the road conditions that are mentioned in the committee paper here today. And in addition, I would like to highlight to the committee that due to the questions that we received on the assumptions made about parental travel, we reflected on this. We gathered information from more of our other establishments to validate whether our assumptions were reasonable. That confirmed to us that the figure of 20% that we use to estimate numbers walking to nursery is consistent with other establishments throughout the council area. That the public transport um, kind of route is not a significant method of travel to our nurseries and generally accounted for between maybe 1 and 5% of trips. And also that the drop off time range between a few minutes and up to 10 minutes, although we have we have used the worst case scenario of 15 minutes within our calculations. Therefore, we do believe the data assumptions and the conclusions reached from the traffic assessment remain valid. The third thing to point out is the lack of outdoor play area within the site boundary and concerns that came um, in regards with that. So our plans do contain a dedicated play area within the nursery boundary. Education Resources has worked extensively with the Cane Inspectorate and with Thrive Outdoor Scotland to develop a comprehensive play area strategy to enhance children's play and learning opportunities in the outdoor environment. There is no agreed standard size set by the Cane Inspectorate for the provision of outdoor space within in an early learning and childcare setting. 
It is the quality of the space that is, is of paramount importance and how it is planned and how it is used will be the indicators considered by the care inspectorate to assess its suitability. In addition to this, the care inspectorate also welcomed the utilisation of community space out with the nursery environment. And as I already highlighted, this nursery would be well situated to make excellent use of the adjacent community assets of Woodine Park and Bothwell Nature Trail by the children of the local community and would greatly enhance opportunities for play and for learning experiences. In summary, education resources, we acknowledge the concerns of the nearby residents. We believe that we have considered those concerns and have provided answers to alleviate the issues identified. Indeed, the, the members that are represented on the other side of the table here today, we have answered in excess of 100 fairly detailed and specific questions. So we feel we have given cognizance to the comments coming forward. Our independent traffic assessment has been reviewed by the Council's roads team and paragraph 6.6 .6 of the planning committee report states that there is unlikely to be an adverse impact on available parking, parking excuse me, and on the wider road network. The report also says that the site has been deemed suitable in terms of all other technical planning requirements and we will of course comply with any conditions that are laid down if the planning permission is granted. So over the last two years, education has received a significant number of representations from parents and carers of nursery age children concerned about the lack of 1140 hours provision in the Bothwell and Uddingston areas. And this new facility, if, if approved, would meet the needs of the local communities and provide the children of Bothwell and Uddingston with a high quality early learning and child care facility, which would be remaining communities to learn, to play and to develop and to support parents and their families with work, study or training. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lynn. I'd like to invite the objectors to ask their questions. They have five minutes to ask questions. And could I ask you that you use this time to ask questions and not make statements? Thank you. Hi there. Um, I've got a question. I know you'd stated that the roadshow um, was held and you'd given, well, really, in all fairness, the roadshow, it was um, Christmas 2019 between 3 and 6 p.m. with a week's notice. But anyway, we've had to ask you a number of questions. I know you pointed that out as well over the emails um, to find out a bit more about the application. But on the response, you actually said that you look at future growth estimates and you actually identify that there's a shortfall of 177 places in this future growth. And this includes private nurseries. Would it not be best practice at this point to identify a larger site to accommodate more children initially and have the ability to expand the site? And all in all fairness, I would agree that this is a better use of a taxpayers' money as well. Lynn, would you like to respond? I was just going to bring in my colleague here, but just access. Hi, hi, Van Sinclair speaking. Uh, although the nursery is registered for 113 children, that means we can actually uh, accommodate more than that over the course of a year. Uh, we use a figure of 1.6 children per place can be accommodated in each place. So that means that up to 180, that this facility registered for 113 children at any one time in the care inspectorate can be utilised for up to 180 and in even in some circumstances could actually be utilised for more children than that over the course of an eight to six working day, five days a week, uh, 50 weeks of the year. Any more questions? This is Michael McLaughlin. I'd like to ask a follow up question on on, on the question that Joanna's just asked. Um, it's a question for Lynn Cherry. Is it the case that you have, irrespective and notwithstanding 
what Mr Sinclair has just said, is it the case that you're projecting a shortfall over the next five years of 177 places? Yes, we, we carried out, um, sorry, I'll just come back on. We carried out a, a review of our numbers, our current um, numbers of children within the area. We looked at housing development, we looked at birth rates, we looked at um, growth, uh, we looked at trends. We considered other factors that were part of the process a number of years ago, which allowed um, the potential at the time, which is now Sorry, going Ms. to Sherry, I mean, we only have five. We only have five minutes here Sorry, to just, have questions. Okay, just, is, the, is the number 177, uh, yes. rather than explain your methodology to us, is, okay. is the number 177? Okay, our, our assumptions that we used in some of the processes that I was describing there led us to conclusion that that would be the shortfall. Okay, that, that, was, that was my question. Okay. Um, now, you wrote to us uh, about the, the abandonment of Appledore as, uh, as a site, and you told us that that was because of the level of objection that you received. Can you, can you tell me how many objections that were, were um, officially made in the portal for the Appledore site? If if I could answer that, the withdrawal of the Appledore application was not due to... Sorry, the, the question I asked was about the number of formal objections in the portal for the Appledore site. That, that was all. My understanding is that there were 21. Yes, and I'm trying to explain. If I no, my, my question was simply was simply about the number of, of objections in no, the Appledore you, site. In you the, in the Appledore you portal, mentioned, sir, that... Uh, we withdrew the application because of the number of of uh, of objections. It's actually the the veracity and the, the of the objections that we looked at. Uh, the objections came in, and we reviewed. We took cognizance of those objections and reviewed our proposals, and that was why we withdrew the application, not due to the number of them. Could you explain? Could you explain to the elected members and indeed us as objectors uh, what the you mean by the veracity of the veracity excuse, of the? Excuse of me, the Mr. McLaughlin, uh, Chair. That's five minutes now past. Thank you, Stuart. I'd like to ask the objectors if they would like to present their case and have ten minutes to present their case. Thank you, Chair. Um, we're not here this morning um, because um, we don't want something in our backyard. We're here because there are 161 objections from all over the Bothwell community. Um, and these are objections of substance. Bothell and the, the Bothwell and Addicts communities need and want a nursery. And that is not in doubt. But for, but for many reasons, this is the worst site of the, those identified as available by some margin. We are truly at a loss as to why officers continue to pursue this site with such vigour when they dropped the Appledore site, a site three times bigger than this one. This site is a terrible site. It is a postage stamp wedged between two blocks of houses on a relatively narrow road it will be cramped for staff and children and will deliver a substandard early years experience. There is no off-road parking. There is little or no room for an outdoor play area. I didn't have a chance to, to ask the question there of Lynn Sherry about how big that area is. There is no. The plan is that the outdoor play will be conducted in a public park. An electricity generator needs to be moved. And as matters stand, we don't know if Scottish Power have even been asked for their consent. It commits 90% of likely users to travel by car and it's going to create a significant road safety issue. This is already a dangerous bottleneck in the mornings and in the afternoons when Bothwell Primary um, is going in and coming out. And the application process and the consultation process have also been terrible. There are, we have identified tw 29 technical deficiencies in the application and none of those have been addressed. Seven technical reports have not been uploaded to the portal, and so the public have not had an opportunity to comment on them. The updated traffic impact assessment 
is not for, fit for purpose because it's based on wildly inaccurate assumptions and the traffic data is five years out of date. If you, if you read the report, you'll realise that there is absolutely no local input into the assumptions made whatsoever. The drawings for the nursery lack any proper detail and the consultation, I'm afraid, is not as Ms Sherry um, has described. I'll now pass over to um, Joanna Pugh, who, who lives in the street, and we'll talk about other issues. Thank you, Michael. This, my street that I live on comprises of 25 houses, some local authority and some ex-local authority. Many of my neighbours are elderly, and in fact, I did email you a letter on Sunday from one of my one of my elderly neighbours, who explains it's been difficult to um, to get their thoughts. And the general consensus is that my neighbours feel uninformed and alienated, as they have limited access and the ability to use technology, leaving them all feeling overwhelmed, apprehensive, and helpless. Nine of my neighbours are octogenarians, nine of 25. The majority of houses are four in a block flats. Residents don't have driveways nor the ability to develop the driveways. In the 10 years I've lived on this street, I've noticed increased traffic and speed, particularly with the first phase of the new houses at Bodwell Bank. I will not allow my children under any circumstances to walk outside my house without myself or my husband being there, as it is so difficult to see past the many parked cars when crossing the busy roads. A major concern about this nursery is that it doesn't have a dedicated car park. I feel this is an imperative requirement, and this will be the only early learning centre in South Lanarkshire to not have an off-road car park. Imagine a scenario, it's cold, it's raining, parents are rushing to get to work, drop their kids off. It only takes a split second for your child to get out of your grasp and they are faced immediately with danger because the car parking provided are not enclosed but at the side of a busy road. I know it's not a nice thought to dwell on, but it's the overwhelming reality of a nursery-aged child with zero road sense and no road danger awareness. As Michael said, the plot of land can only be described as a postage stamp between two houses. It, the nursery building is so large and two storey high, there is little space for outdoor play area. Again, when I've posed this question to officers, we've told about the large play park in Moudin. This is a public park. I don't think it's safe to have groups of preschool children utilising a pu public park. Imagine sunny day, the park's busy, a staff member is looking after the children. Ratio is one adult to eight children. See a child falls in the busy park, a staff member attends to them, then looks up to find another child has wandered off or been taken. Child safety must be a priority in a nursery. Another significant flaw is that the nursery does not have space for expansion and already we've been faced with the 177 shortfall of places in the projected future. All in all, this is not getting it right for every child. This is shortchanging our children. I'll now pass you on to David to analyse the traffic. Thank you. OK, thanks, Joanna. Uh, virtually every one of the 161 objections raises real concerns about transport traffic and parking. Now, I'm going to use the time to focus on the drop off and pick up of children, which is a core linchpin to the whole application. The nursery just won't work effectively without a good solution. Now, so the transport assessment first published only last month uh, proposes four laybys on Clyde Terrace with 60 parking spaces. And that's to meet the needs of residents, nursery staff and nursery users. And to make this work, there's a very complicated formula, including, for example, the requirement for no more than 14 cars to arrive precisely every 15 minutes during the peak morning period, which sounds a bit too precise for the real world. Now, there are lots of other flaws in this proposal, but the biggest one is you can't physically fit 60 spaces into the four laybys. 
So last Thursday, a significant U-turn saw the planner's report suggest 32 spaces, almost half the number pre previously proposed. There's no explanation for this deviation, no rationale offered on how the 32 spaces might work. We think that's because they won't work. In the peak morning period, the transport assessment states local residents and staff arriving early at eight o'clock will account for 25 spaces. So that leaves seven spaces to accommodate around 77 cars arriving to drop off. But those 77 cars won't be the only ones competing for the seven spaces. Drivers whose children are a bit older uh, will compete to use these spaces to avoid the horrendous traffic congestion at Bothell Primary just around the corner. Early morning dog walkers will use the laybys to access the biggest open green space in Bothell, right behind the nursery. Changing demographics of Clyde Terrace, Joanna's already mentioned, will mean increased car ownership and further use of the laybys in the short to medium term. The bottom line is this proposal will generate chaos, congestion, increased accident and collision risk and cause unacceptable inconvenience for parents, staff and local residents. The drop off and pick ups need to be a core part of this planning application, not something to be conditioned for later. We believe members are entitled to ask why there isn't a thorough, professional, credible plan for parking in this application. Instead, what we've got is a last minute abandonment of the previous proposal, almost half the number of parking spaces. One, one no, minute remaining. No explanation offered and a request you approve the application conditional on a traffic management plan being sorted out. We don't think that's good enough and we'd like to ask members to reject or at least defer this application until a thoroughly credible future-proofed transport plan has been prepared and consulted on. I'll hand back to Michael to conclude. Thank you. Thank you, David. Listen, we understand that councils have to get things done. They have to get decisions made and they're not always popular. Somebody will always disagree with the decision. We accept that. We know that there is, a, there, is there has to be space for pragmatism, but this will be a decision with catastrophic, potentially catastrophic consequences for, the, for the, the local community and the wider community. There are real serious issues of substance here, both in the application and the site itself. And if you have any doubts today, then I urge you to defer the decision. We asked for an independent, we asked the head of education for an independent traffic audit to be carried out, and that was refused. Traffic is a material issue here, and there are safety issues. Let's have a site visit. Let's all congregate down there one morning at 8.45 and let's see for ourselves. Let's make together a sensible decision for the communities of Bothell and Uddingston. One that Can doesn't... to conclude your final comment, please? One that doesn't let down the parents and the children. Thank you. I'd like to invite the applicants to ask questions. So five minutes to ask questions and could ask that you ask questions and not make statements. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have no questions to ask at this time. OK, thank you. Do any members have any questions from either the applicants or the objectors? And if you do, could you indicate who you'd like to ask the question of? Councillor Thompson? Can you hear us OK, Chair? Hello? Hello? Can you yes, hear me can okay, you hear you OK? Right, thank you. Just a quick question to Lynn. Can I ask during the process, uh, I don't know the area very well, how many other sites were looked at and was there solid reasons for refusing them? Just to get sort of a lie of the land there, just how many sites were uh, looked at? Thank you. I'll, I'll pass you over to my colleague, but we looked at, I think, 16 alternative sites in the area. But I'll pass over to Vance, who'll maybe explain a little bit further. Yes, councillor, we basically looked at all uh, land ownership within uh, South, South Lanarkshire's ownership in the Uddingston and Bodwell area. Uh, we chose 16 sites that we looked at uh, and uh, came, came up with 
uh, there was challenges to to all of those sites uh, and eventually got came to the conclusion that Clyde Terrace was the, the the best site and most of the other ones if not all the other ones are not developable for a nursery for various reasons whether it be size location okay thanks very much uh, for that Vance it's just it's interesting you know just to make sure that things were comprehensively thought there okay, chair just your indulgence you just say as well there just that I know it's daunting coming to these things so I, th I think the uh, the three people who spoke there good clarity uh, and uh, it was worthwhile hearing from so thanks very much I know it's no easy coming to the committee thank you okay thank you Councillor Dunley uh, this is to Vans. Uh, Vans, would you believe that this wasn't without its problems, this site? Because I do actually know this. I know Clyde Valley. I know the Clyde area. Um, and well, I've got my opinion. So, sorry, I'm not sure. Just the question you're actually asking, Councillor. Could you? The clarify? question. The question is, although you picked this site. Would would you accept that there was problems with this site itself? Yes, councillor. The, there have been challenges with this site, uh, most particularly the parking issue. Uh, but hopefully, we've come to a, a sensible conclusion uh, with with uh, roads and transportation services with regard to that. Without without the on street parking, the the site would not be suitable for a nursery. Can I, come back, can I come back with a, another yes. observation? Sorry. Yes. Um, I don't know who it would go to, whether it be Lynn or Vance. Um, it's in terms of the safety um, with the amount of area for the children to be outside playing and learning from outside play. Um, what is your opinion on that? and the area that's covered for the children to play. I think if it's OK, I'm going to bring in um, Morag McDonald. Uh, she's our early years manager, so she would be able to describe how that set up sort of works. We have other uh, nurseries that have a similar size kind of site area for external play. There's one thing I maybe wanted to ask for a uh, mention from the previous question there, just to clarify in terms of um, this being the only site where we have uh, on road parking as opposed to a dedicated area. We do have other nurseries, we have Glenborough, but we do not have on site parking. So just to, to let you know about that. But maybe if I could pass to Morag, she's out there. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Chair. Um, Councillor Donnelly, in terms of outdoor learning, obviously we have invested significantly as a council following the, the Inspiring Scotland and the Scottish Government statement in terms of the benefits of outdoor learning, particularly in the context of COVID and the amount of progression that we've made this year has been significant. In terms of children going outdoors, um, obviously risk assessments are in place for taking the children outdoors. So whilst doors are open and children can freely access whatever space is available, then taking them beyond to give them a wealth of experiences out either into the community or in this instance where it would be primarily would deem that that is really on site allows staff to go out not by themselves but usually it is a minimum of two staff and with a maximum of eight children so every experience that would go out with the children is planned so that the curriculum planning indoors within the nursery is actually cohesive and actually extends out to whatever the children are actually doing outdoors so it's not just a case of the children going outside to have a run around. Yes, there is a time and a place for that to fund to happiness, to look at the children's health and well-being. But more importantly, I think it's about looking at if they're learning about number, for example, outside and we go out into the park, that planning extends and actually is seamless between the learning that takes place inside and the learning that takes place outside. So therefore we have other opportunities across the council um, usually not in our doorstep the way this would be to actually allow children to look for those experiences, expertise, activities, engagement in activities in, in a natural world 
developing that true sense of nature of the world around them, of respect for their community and indeed the experiences that can go on outdoors. So we see it as a very enriched environment and that the children would be taken out, but obviously risk assessed. Yes, there will be times where they, they go outside. There is also physical activities indoors, as you can see, the, the size of the nursery that would be and indeed complemented robustly by the experiences that would take place outdoors. Thank you. There's another hand up, but I don't know who it is. Do you know who it is, Stuart? Chair Councillor Callaghan's got her hand raised. Thank you, Councillor Callaghan. Also got my hand raised, uh, Chair. So have I. I have to. Thank you, Chair. I thought I wasn't going to get in there. Um, I did have my hand up from quite early on. Um, I've actually got three questions, um, but first of all, I just wanted to, to make a comment quite quickly as well. Um, Mr McLaughlin, um, during the five minutes questioning, started asking a question, but was then interrupted and not allowed to finish it. I think it would be reasonable that if we have someone that started a question that we do, we do actually allow them to finish and get an answer on that there. I had put my hand up at that point in time. Um, my questions, Chair, Mr McLaughlin um, was asking at that point, I think, about the veracity of the objections at Appledore that Vance had mentioned. So I'm wondering if Vance could expand on that. My second question is about the, the change in the car spaces. Um, it was mentioned by Mr Budge that originally there were six spaces down that had changed to 32 and that there wasn't an explanation there for that. So I was wondering if we could have an explanation for that change. And my final question is, what are our plans for the projected shortfall of 177 nursery places? Thank you. I think the first question was at me. Uh, in, in terms of the Appledore application, what I was trying to get at was it wasn't the number of the applications that was uh, the, the objections that was important, but it was Basically, uh, we reflected on on the what those objections were and came to a conclusion that they they had merit. Rather, so rather than the number of applications, is what I was uh, getting at was it was actually the the relevance of those objections. Thanks, Vance. Um, could you could you just see what the relevance was? I think that was Mr. Going to be Mr. McLaughlin's question. Thanks. All right, it, it was more. To do with uh, Appledore Crescent being uh, a cul-de-sac, cul uh, which was the main access or the, the access to the nursery, uh, they had, as opposed to Clyde Terrace, it had uh, it's got a very uh, narrow carriageway with double parking of cars on both sides to the point where they're parked up on the pavement in order to allow uh, another car to get past. That is not the case on Clyde Terrace which has a much wider carriageway. Uh, so we'd, after receiving those objections, we reflected on them uh, and agreed that they had merit. Thank you. Thank you. I think Councillor Driver was next. Sorry, Chair, I asked three questions. That was just one that was answered. Oh, sorry, apologies. Thanks. The second uh, one was about this change of species. Uh, maybe I, I could answer that again. I, I'm I'm a, I'm confused at this. We we the six spaces doesn't uh, or, or sixty spaces doesn't equate to me. Uh, all I can say is we have worked with roads and transportation services uh, to expand the the car parking that we provided there to a level which they feel is. Uh, sufficient to meet the demands of uh, the nursery and the, the residential car parking area. Uh, and roads have, I think, confirmed that in the report that the 32 spaces that we now have in the finalised port, uh, report are sufficient to uh, cater for uh, the drop off and the uh, and the, the workers as, as well. One, one thing to highlight is this is not a, a school nursery where all the, the parents are coming at nine o'clock and picking up at three o'clock. Uh, this nursery is an all-day nursery and the peak period is actually between eight o'clock in the morning and 9.30. In addition to that, we don't have staff all starting and finishing at the same time, but they actually 
uh, start and finished on uh, a shift pattern as well. So it's much more it's much more spread in terms of the parents dropping off and picking up than uh, would be the normal case at a school nursery, for instance, at St Bride's. And sorry, what was the, the third question, Councillor Callahan? Sorry, the third question was what are the plans for the projected shortfall of the 177 species? Do we have plans for that at the moment? We're currently... Re um, Just, this new facility is the, the solution to the Bothwell and Uddingston area. So is there not a shortage of 177 spaces then, Lynn? Yes. The provision of this facility will allow us to accommodate the excess coming into the area. So this is the solution. All right, sense? OK. I thought when it was asked earlier on, um, you'd said, yes, there was a shortfall. My apologies for yeah, that. that um, thanks. Sorry, sorry. Um, just just uh, con considering what Van said there about the, the change from 60 to 32 species that, that Mr Budge mentioned, um, fans didn't seem to be aware of that and if, I'm wondering if Mr Budge would maybe be able to clarify that for his chair, what the issue was. Yeah, am I off mute? Uh, no, we've already had questions and answers here, so I'm, I think we should be That's... moving on. Well, Councillor Dybra? Chair, the, the question was directed at the, the applicants. Chair, I actually asked the applicant the question there. Oh, sorry, apologies, apologies. Thank you. Mr Budge? Sorry, can you hear me OK? Yes. Yes, OK. So the transport assessment quite clearly talks about the creation of 60 spaces, and it's there in black and white. Um, and, and th this argument about roads have come to a conclusion. The only conclusion that's come to here is they've realised you can't fit 60 spaces. And the transport assessment made their calculations on the basis of having 60 spaces available. The only thing that roads have done is worked out 32 spaces are, are you know, can now be accommodated, not 60 in that space. They haven't explained how the whole system will work and whether that's enough. As I said, we've looked at this in great detail and the 60 spaces were, was certainly mentioned um, and a key feature of the lay-by solution in the transport assessment. And to claim otherwise, I'm afraid, is just completely wrong. Thank you. OK, Councillor Dalton. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of questions for education. I'll, I'll give you my first one. Um, it says that there's 25 members of staff. I'm, I'm wondering, is that full-time equivalent or is it actual number of people? That's full-time equivalent. Um, okay. And of course, they'll be on a, a shift rotor, some of them starting at eight, some of them starting all the way through till 10 o'clock. In the morning to cover the eight the, the ten yeah. till six shift. But but obviously they're going to be overlaps as well. They can't possibly work without an overlap, I would suggest. Yes, there will be overlaps, yeah. Okay. okay. I, I want to clarify that. Um and just something else um that really um probably for Vance, I would say. Um and it's you know what Mr Budge has said, um, it does, I've read the documents, it does quite clearly say 60 and then all of a sudden conveniently there's 32 spaces. I was a bit confused with that myself. Um, what I'm, I'm really concerned about, um, and just maybe you, you'll be able to answer, um, is that we're talking about a lay-by here. So it, it, it says that at the moment there's parking on both sides of the road at present. So I'm assuming the lay-by is really just defining these into spaces but not really adding spaces and just correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, so th there seems to be a bit of a contradiction because it says that, that it's amended to include the provision of formalised on-street parking um, um, and these will be available for residents but it's it you know it says these spaces would be unrestricted available for residents and the nursery so really it you know that that's not formalised on-street parking for staff and visitors. Um, so would it, but my main question here is the travel plan talks of encouraging sustainable travel. Now, that, that's a condition. It's just, it's just sitting in there. We don't have any idea how that's going to work. Um, we've got no guarantees. Um, 
Now, if you'd put in a school streets initiative where the police can then enforce that there's no traffic moving in here except for residents and for blue badge holders and other permitted vehicles, I could have seen how that's going to work. It's worked in areas in Edinburgh, but there's there's this just very vague sort of um, will encourage sustainable travel, and I just don't see how this is going to work um, with 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 that. Um, and just one last thing, sorry, I wanted to ask. Transport have said that there's 800 metres for the catchment, um, and I was always under the impression impression that there's no catchment area for a nursery. So is that changed? I, I, I didn't. I wasn't aware it was changed. So if you could just clarify that. No, there's no catchments for nurseries. The 800 metres was just taken in the report as a a, a sensible walking distance for 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 children. Uh, it's actually at the lower end of the scale and what is acceptable in terms, I'm, I'm not a, a transport engineer, but the transport engineers have come back to say that Scottish government guidance says that to a 20 to 30 uh, minute walking uh, distance is, is, is within the guidelines. But because it's a nursery, uh, when they were doing their, their, their evaluations, they took a, a a distance of 800 metres rather than a thousand or two thousand metres, which would have been acceptable under the Scottish government's uh, transport uh, assessment guidelines. Yeah. Well, so can I, can you then just answer me then about the 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 parking? You know, is there actually additional parking there or not? Because it, it's it's not very clear. And if it's not formalised, part if it if it's only parking for anyone then how has it actually solved any of the parking issues for the staff or the, the people dropping in and off? I'm just, I can't see it from the plans. Right, it's it's not dedicated parking. It's parking uh, and it's dedicated bays. There are six uh, new bays, I think, along the front of the nursery. The rest of them are formalising uh, existing uh, car parking arrangements. Uh, it's, in order to do that, the, the, Pavement, which is very wide uh, on the opposite side from the, the, the houses, is, is to be reduced, which will allow the parking bays to be made without impinging uh, significantly on the actual uh, width of the, the carriageway, thereby allowing two cars to still pass each other uh, without having to stop. Okay, thank you. Could I, um, this is Lynn here, sorry, could I add a, a couple of things? I was maybe going to bring in Morag again about the travel plan. You were talking about um, sustainable travel. It's kind of akin to school travel plans that we have in place for all of our schools as well. And I wondered if Morag is out there who would be able to kind of describe once a nursery is up and running, how we link in with parents to try and encourage um, their routes here's, to here's, go to the nursery. And is this an opportunity for the applicants to have a, a longer period of submissions? Because if it is and if it's allowed, I would make a, a respectful request that um, we're allowed to say something because this seems like just an opportunity for them to expand their 10 minutes. It's not. Councillor yeah. Driver asked a question yeah. about so, travel plan. plan. Sorry. Sorry, Lynn, yes. Um, did Lynn answer the questions? Yeah, Councillor Driver had asked about the travel plan. It just seems like it's written in the report as though it's just, you know, a phrase and it doesn't have any sort of validity. Could we explain that? So just to explain how that operates, more I could come in. I'm also wondering as a suggestion that um, there's numbers of 66, 32. There's a lot of numbers out there, whether it would be appropriate to, to bring in the roads expert who will be in the committee somewhere who maybe could explain some of this in more detail if that would help. But if Morag's there, maybe Morag could answer Councillor Driver's question about travel plans and how we enact them. Hi Lynn, thanks. Um, just to, to give you the information, once actually we're setting up a nursery or in day-to-day -day operation of a nursery, then we actually have um, protocols in place that we actually speak to the parents and actually explain what we're doing. Obviously we want children to be as active and the parents to, to walk as well and walk as safely as we possibly can. And in relation to that, um, then basically what we do find is that quite a significant number of our parents actually walk to the, the establishment and then walk away. Yes, there are people that travel by, by car. There's other people that actually travel minimal numbers, though, by, by public transport. It certainly isn't as much. And what we find is that once a nursery becomes embedded into a community, you actually find that that 
ownership of that establishment encourages people to walk um, to the nursery to get their child through their community to actually appreciate what's going on and even park further away and walk to the nursery. That's the generalities of what actually happens when it's young children. If you actually look at the younger ones, there's two to three year olds here, depending on how able those two to three year olds are. Again, what you will find is in quite a number of occasions that if the parents are pushing them in in a pram and a buggy, then basically they will walk to that establishment as well. So considering we don't have catchment areas, then basically parents come from varying agent areas and actually use different modes of transport to actually get to the establishment. Predominantly, I would have to say walking in quite a number of instances. Thank you, Maura. So can I just, Chair, can I just respond to that then? Um, that, that That's not my experience at all in my ward. And forgive me then if it's maybe just my ward. My experience is that most people use their car and they drop off. We've got massive congestion throughout my ward. Um, children going to nurseries and schools. Um, um, we've got such bad issues that staff can't get parked in some of them. Um, so, um, and a lot of people that are dropping their children off are on their way to their work. So I, I, you're saying that they're predominantly walking. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. But what, I'm, I'm, what I was actually talking about, sustainable travel, is the condition in there is about sustainable travel. Now, in Edinburgh, they have told your people you can't use this road unless you're a resident there. You can't use it at all. Now, we either go one way or the other. You either say you can't use it. Um, um, uh, now, that, that's not necessarily very convenient for parents either. But if, if you're trying to avoid congestion, you, you know, encouraging people to walk, <laughs> you know, I, 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 you've maybe got a lot more faith in, than, than me, but I, I personally don't see that um, as being much of a condition. I'm, I'm sorry. Thanks, Chair. Uh, it's just a general point, please, Chair. I mean, I am aware that we're not used to operating in this forum. We, we don't hold a lot of hearings and we certainly never held a hearing before in this online forum and it is very, very difficult. Just procedurally though, I am a bit concerned that this is a, a question and answer session for um, members to be able to ask questions of the applicants and the objectors and I do feel in a lot of the debate now we're, we're going into what should be the main part of the debate after the Q&A session is finished. The applicants and objectors are no long, longer able to speak and then we go into the general debate. So I just feel a bit uneasy, Chairman, and I just wonder, please, if I could ask um, both the members asking the questions and also the applicants and the objectors answering the question to stick to the questions and not go into general statements, which can be picked up in the, the main part of the debate. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Pauline. There's another hand up. I don't know who it is, sorry. Could it be me? Councillor Water, yeah. Yeah, go yeah. ahead, Tim. Yeah. It's, it's an odd situation where we've got 90% of the parking spaces for use by the, the, the parents and, and children are on the opposite side of the street. And we're going to have a situation where there will be some parents arriving, some parents leaving, and a, a fairly concentrated part of the, the morning and perhaps evening and, and, and late afternoon. And it, it, it just seems cause for concern that we're going to have a situation where we're going to have young children and parents crossing the street while some are arriving, some are leaving, some have arrived and are already crossing, and it'll happen both ways, you know, morning and evening. Was any consideration given to provide crossing at the nursery to get out of the cars and walk across what's clearly a, quite a busy bit of road? Sorry, John, who's your question directed to? That's to, to Vance. Hi, Councillor. Uh, I, yeah, I think the, the, the Rose Department have looked at this and uh, uh, there's conditions to, we've ag agreed we would take up to provide two pedestrian uh, crossing uh, crossings on the road and also a number of other safety features built, uh, build outs with raised platforms, which will uh, help to slow traffic. So roads have looked at the, the matter. I don't know if they wish to comment uh, and they have put a number of conditions on us to further enhance traffic safety through two 
pedestrian crossings and further speed reduction measures. Could, could I come back on that, Chair? Uh, you, you say two crossings. Are we talking about controlled crossings or are we just simply talking about markings on the roadway? Because I can think of schools in my ward where there are crossings and in inverted commas which are marks on the road. And what I find is that people actually park on those crossings. You know, when I say a control crossing, I mean a light control crossing, which which is quite clear to everybody. That gives you know, uh, precedence to, to pedestrians and it stops the traffic. Maybe Rhodes want to comment. We would basically put in whatever they advise is, is the most appropriate uh, uh, crossing counsellor. Yeah, that's what we can ask later on, John, when we are going to the general discussion. Yeah, we'll do. Any other questions for applicants or objectors? Yeah, Chair Councillor Allison's got his hand raised. Thank you, Councillor Allison. Thanks, Chair. I have a number of questions. Um, first of all, I'd like to clarify there was a statement made regarding the sites that we could use and Scottish Government laying down certain um regulations as to the sites is that simply to do with the funding that they will contribute um or is there any legal issues that we cannot within the council ourselves consider sites owned by others other than ourselves following do you want all the questions in the one chair Yes, after all, who is it to? Right. Um, it was whoever was stating that there was issues regarding uh, sites we could consider. Bernard, uh, well, you stated that one of your issues or one of your criteria was the locations you had to evaluate. Can you tell us that if there is any other site, either publicly or privately owned, within this area, that ward, that would be suitable for a nursery? Um, within the planning uh, application there, Scottish Water are stating they will not accept any surface water. What solution do you have for that? The traffic impact assessment, um, exactly when was that done? And what account has been taken? I believe there is a new development currently being built further down, further in that area that this road is the access to. Has it taken that into account at all? Um, now going to be ageist. What is the age demographic within that area? Can either um, education or the objectors give us an indication? Joanna, I believe, gave us some figures earlier. Um, and are you aware that if the Scottish government guidelines of up to 2,000 metres, I think you said, Vans, for children, for nursery pupils walking, is greater than we expect our primary school children? to walk to school. Um, could the objectors give us an indication in layman's terms what the traffic congestion is like on that road at the moment? And is there free parking available regardless of whether it's formalised or not? Um, and there's a little bit and well, Vance, you were saying that uh, the reason the previous application elsewhere was rejected is because of the veracity of the objections. Are you suggesting here that none of the objections have uh, any merit? Yeah, that sort of thing. Covered everybody. Scattergun approach. Do you think about it? Um, sorry, it's, <coughs> it's Lynn here. I'm going to try, try to scribble as many questions down there as you were you're saying. You might need to repeat a few, but just to start at the top, in terms of the Scottish Government funding and looking at sites that were in private ownership, yes, it was connected to funding. Um, you'll know that the Scottish Government set aside significant amounts of money to be transferred to local authorities to allow 1140 to take place. So, yes, that um, premise we set ourselves was based on funding. Doesn't mean we couldn't go outside, but it was based on funding. Um, the locations to evaluate, you're asking if there's anything else out there. We don't believe so. As we said before, we looked at six, 16 different sites and we did because people brought it to us, looked at a small number of kind of private um, sites that were out there as well and came to the conclusion for one reason or another, as Vance described, that they, they weren't suitable. So we're not aware of anything else that may be out there. 
Um, you asked about runoff of water, Scottish water. I think we have had, Vance will maybe correct me, I think we have had some discussions with Scottish water and we don't believe there are any issues. Um, Sorry to interrupt, Lynn. In the papers it says Scottish water will not accept any surface water into their system. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that I don't believe there are issues with the um, the road itself that will cause us issues. I can confirm that. That's that's quite common in our discussions with Scottish Water um, in our schools development, nursery development, and we have to seek alternative means. That's, that's a, it's not an uncommon issue. Okay. Question. Sorry for interrupting, Vance, but the question then was what is the uh, solution? I don't know that at this time, councillor. That that in in most of our applications, that that's a, a detail that's that's uh, that's negotiated with Scottish Power, Scottish Water, and, and, and Scottish Water sorry, and, and, and uh, as the the application progresses, uh, I just know that our engineers are not uh, have have not voiced any concerns over obtaining. Uh, an appropriate connection, but I don't I don't know the detail of it. OK. Sorry if I can keep going in terms of can I come back to the traffic assessment because you kind of for me cut off a wee bit, so I think I need to get you to repeat that question. Um, you asked about age demographics. Um, we don't hold, I don't have any, I'm sitting, not sitting with any specific age demographics just now in front of me. Um, when we do look at forecasting, we look at the sort of current, we look at trends, um, we look at birth rates and we look at housing development and we have indicators that uh, um, lead us to make conclusions about how many children we think will be generated from a uh, housing development. So maybe that'll answer your question. You asked about Scottish Government guidelines about the 2000 metres, maybe just to reiterate that that was information that's used as part of that traffic assessment advance can maybe come in and correct me about what is a reasonable making assumptions about people's mode of travel what would be a reasonable expectation about how far people would walk um, in today's world and we actually decreased that knowing that this was nursery we decreased that to 800 meters when we looked at the or when the consultants looked at the traffic uh, assessment the question i need to come back to was about you were asking about the traffic assessment but you broke up a little bit so could you repeat uh, that question yeah certainly Lynn. Traffic, asse traffic impact assessment, when was it done and uh, did it take into account the development that is currently underway, I believe, and uses this street as the access? Yeah, uh, yes, the, it was concluded in January and yes, it does take into consideration all the developments uh, in the area and they've also uh, identified an uplift in the numbers as per consultants do to uh, to 2022 I think was was their assessment period. So they've looked at the existing planning approvals and they've uplifted because I think the initial survey was, was 2000 that they, they used was the Bodwell Bank one which was 2016-17 and they've uplifted the numbers to take cognizance of increased traffic levels from that period of time. They have also uh, used the information uh, at Bothwell Primary School as well in terms of the traffic numbers there. So that it's as up to date as it could possibly be as far as we're concerned, Council. Thank you. OK, Alec. Yeah, I also asked if the if the objectors could comment on the congestion at the moment um, in layman's terms. Um, very much aware of the work that Fraser does, very good at his game, but often the discrepancy, not discrepancy, the difference between what local residents and um, traffic officers find is acceptable uh, is not very similar. So if the objectors could give us an indication as to what the traffic congestion is like at the moment and also to do with the amount of parking whether the uh, how busy it is I'll, 
I'll perhaps start, this is Michael McLaughlin. I'll perhaps start that, and if David or Joanna want to come in, I'll be I'll be brief uh, because I'm at the centre of the the traffic vortex. This is a heavily congested area um, at pick up and drop off because largely because of Bothell Primary is 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 literally 300 yards from where this nursery will be, and that causes significant congestion such that Blantyre Mill Road. Blantyre Mill Road and Castle Road become single track roads because of cars parked on one side of them and it becomes a real bottleneck and you have to imagine that people are also trying to get out to work in the morning as well so it's not just um, school traffic and nursery traffic. So already these cars are parked all along the pavements right round from Bothell Primary right round right onto Blantyre Mill Road and onto, and, and onto Clyde Terrace so it's a significant bottleneck. Now the houses, the development you're referring to, Councillor Allison, were built, and and we I didn't object to that because houses in the area is a good thing. New families coming in that has created a significant increase in traffic flow into this vortex because they come up from down towards the the, the David Livingston Bridge. They come up at some pace onto Blantyre Mill Road, and that's that's an estate of, of about 50, 60, or if not more houses. And um, so that has added to the traffic congestion. And we really are just about at the, the, the tipping point here where we really have a, a serious road safety issue. And that's now going to spill around into to Clyde Terrace. And one important aspect, two, two final, final points on this, there's going to be people who will be dropping off at Bothell Primary and will be dropping off at the nursery. And they will park, they will park there. You get people from Bothell Primary, Primary who will also park in Clyde Terrace, even if they're not going to the nursery. And so there will be far fewer spaces than, than the officers contemplate. The traffic data, as we understand it, that used is, is five years out of date. If that was, if there was any traffic monitoring done in January of this year during a lockdown, when schools were either closed um, or, or with very limited capacity and with everybody working at home, I would suggest that any study carried out in January of, of 2021 to establish traffic flows in the roads around here would be incredibly um, misleading in terms of the actual um, traffic flow. I say again, when things ease up here, perhaps a, a, site, if a site visit would show you just exactly the bottleneck that this area is already. And with another 90% of people will have to drive to this nursery. So you imagine sticking through another 70 cars through here when everybody's trying to get to work and to Bothell Primary and you will have a significant traffic black spot with the attendant safety risks that that brings. I could also add in to that point as well, Michael. Um, regarding, well, because as you know, I live on the street, so I know um, what the traffic's like on a daily basis, what the parking's like on a daily basis. Um, for instance, one of my neighbour has got five vehicles. Now that's work vans and things like that, but five vehicles to one house. Um, so these are the people that will be using these car parking spaces. And when the nursery users come in the morning, it will end up double parked, one in the lay-by and one on the roadside. And that is not a good mix with children whatsoever. And it needs to be seriously reconsidered. Um, I know as well, you, um, with the neighbours, as I said, when I had spoke about it as well, um, a lot of them don't have the ability to develop driveways. So that's not an option that they could then put a driveway to bring their car off the road and leave the road for the nursery users. So that isn't anything that can be looked at. Um, and I know you asked the question and Lynn said about the users, she doesn't have that information to hand, but the in the, the traffic assessment that was carried out and instructed by them, albeit the traffic assessment was, and in its own words said to support this application, but it states that 50% of the users are from Uddingston and Tannock side. So that will be 50% passing Bodwell Primary traffic in the morning and in the evening for drop-offs and pick-ups. Now, Bodwell Primary traffic, I know you said, Vance, that it wasn't covered, it, it was covered in these reports. Well, it, it is not in either the Miller traffic report, which 
this traffic report bases its findings on, and it was not covered in the Tetra Tech traffic report that was um, instructed to support this application. So I just wanted to make that point clear. Another one was Stephanie, um, Councillor Stephanie Callaghan had asked about the shortfall of the 177. Lynn, I don't think you answered that question properly. In the documentation that you sent to us, it, there is a table in that that states projected shortfall will be 177 places after this nursery is built. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I just wanted to make the, the point again. I think we are um, veering away from a Q&A session here and we're having mm -hmm. objectors making statements and answering questions on behalf of the applicant. So I would ask people at this stage to keep to a Q&A. I think we are veering mm -hmm. off that, Chairman. Thank you. Thanks, Polly. Any other questions? Chair, Councillor Nayland's got her hand raised. Thank you, Councillor Nayland. Thank you, Chair. I've got um, two relatively simple questions for the objectors to answer, if that's OK. Um, the first one is, um, Bothwell and Uddingston, it, it does need a nursery, and there have been over 160 representations, and yet there is not one letter of support in amongst all, all those representations. Um, I wondered if the objectors could illuminate um, why, um, if they've had feedback from the community, why none of the par parents or carers that would be attending this nursery have, have come out in support of it. That's the first question for them. And the second question is, if a parent was to bring a child from Uddingston who had no access to their own transport, to, to their own car, how long would it take them to walk to this nursery or walk, use a mixture of walking and use of public transport um, to give us an idea of um, <clears throat> of how appropriate this location is in terms of access for people that do not have their own transport. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Neil. David Joanna, I'll field the first question if that's all right. And David Joanna, could you um, field Councillor Neil's second question? Um, my short answer to why there's nothing in support of it is that there is there is no factor, there is no factor at all to commend this plan and this application because the site is simply inappropriate not fit for purpose um the only in looking at the sort of you know the sort of facebook pages and the, the local chat that you sometimes get the only thing that has the only thing that has been said in favor is well if, if it's that or nothing we're better to take that but of course it's not that site or nothing the, the funding doesn't disappear if if we don't use that site so that's that's the only thing that i've really heard in the local chats um, in social media in support of it. There is nothing else to support that site. Um, the Apple so the Apple Door site is is three times the size. And there, there may be traffic issues there, but it is three times the size. Um, and could you feel the second question, David, which was about the sort of travelling and the difficulties in public transport from, from those 50% coming from Uddingston and Tannock side? Yeah, sure thing. Uh... OK, so, yeah, public transport really is a bit of a non-starter for the nursery, despite claims to the contrary. So to take specifically the question about Uddingston, there is a bus service, the 255, which runs two buses per hour. And uh, from Uddingston Cross to get to the relevant stop in Bodwell only takes eight minutes. However, what the transport assessment doesn't point out is it depends on where you live in Uddingston, how long it takes you to walk to the bus stop, waiting time. When you get off the bus uh, on the main street in Bodwell, you've got a 600 metre walk to get to the nursery. And then the parent or carer has that journey on the way back to go home. Now, we've looked at this in some detail and the reality is that journey would take one hour. So if you're dropping off and picking up your child from Uddingston, you're going to be spent, the parent carer is going to be spending two hours a day on a bus. It gets a lot worse if you're coming from uh, the G71 five and six postcodes. The bus service there, when it runs, which isn't always, 
highly unreliable. It's called the 203. Uh, to, it does a big loop from Bell's Hill round back through Bodlow. Uh, for anyone up in View Park, Tannock Side, Birkinshaw, that journey would take 45 minutes there and 45 minutes back home, which is, um, if, if you're going to be, that's going to be three hours a day if you're dropping off and picking up. It's completely uh, a non-starter for people to use public transport. Um, so, I mean, the, the other point to make on the, the walking distances to nursery, which feeds into this whole sustainable travel thing, uh, we're not arguing that uh, three-year-old kids can't walk for a thousand or fifteen hundred meters. What we are saying is it's going to take them quite a long time. The transport assessment used the typical walking speed of a healthy adult uh, to work out the 800 meter walking zone, and it didn't account for stopping at traffic lights, crossing roads, or anything else. Not only that, but it also claimed that a significant proportion of uh, the users lived within this 800 meter walk zone. That's completely untrue. The vast majority of housing estates in Bodo, which are favored by young families, lie well outside um, this zone. So again, particularly for parents who are maybe going on to work, uh, walking that kind of distance with a three-year-old and then going back home to get the car and then go to work is again, it's it's a non-starter. The reality is if you were looking for a site that actually maximized the use of cars, then Clyde Terrace is the right choice. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for applicants or objectors? Chair Councillor McLaughlin's get his hand raised. Thank you, Councillor McLaughlin. Chair, yeah, thanks very much. <clears throat> um, I feel as if we're not making enough progress on this. Um, I think there's a lot more information that could come from the roads department. I noticed that Pauline has suggested that the, the official from the roads could intervene and maybe answer some of these questions. But I'm actually starting to believe that now, today, we're not going to be able to resolve all of these issues and, and have a proper decision-making process. So I would like to formally move that we continue this until we get a proper traffic assessment and parking assessment from the roads department. I just feel as if we're going round in circles and we're not going to get anywhere today. I'd like a second for that, please. That's yeah, that's that. When we, yeah, after we've had the report summed up. I'd second that. After the questions and answers from the applicants and objectors have been given, you'll be able to ask the Roads Department any question you want to ask. Chair Pauline's suggested in the messaging on the, on the chat that perhaps the Roads official could come in. There's nothing to stop them coming in. I mean, OK, I would then like to, if that's what you're suggesting, can I ask the Roads official to come in and try and answer some of these questions? Because it seems as if too many people are trying to second guess what the answers may be. And for a Rose official there, he might as well give us his input. Or she. I agree with the councillor that we do need input from roads. However, the, the point I was I was trying to make, and I do realise this is an unusual scenario, not aided by the fact that we're having to do it online, Chairman, is that this particular session was for questions and answers from the members to the applicant and the objectors. The normal detailed debate comes thereafter, so it's not the correct time. It would be procedurally incorrect for the roads officer to intervene at this point. However, the roads, the roads officer is our technical advisor at the planning committee. He is a technical advisor to the planning authority and to the committee, and you do need to hear from him. But I suggest, Chairman, you need to hear from him in the main part of the debate. So once the question and answer session is over, then go on to the main debate. If members then want to, to vote for a deferral, having heard from him, that's a different um, matter. But I think you have to get to that point and then take an informed decision. Thank you, Chair. Chair, uh, th thanks very much for that, Pauline. Um, as has been mentioned earlier, we're not that used to having these types of hearings, especially not online. 
So could I ask you, Chair, to try and sort of bring this to some sort of conclusion because it just seems to be rolling on, and I said that earlier. Um, I just don't feel as if we're getting anywhere. Yes, I was just about to ask if there's any more questions for applicants or objectors. There's no other hands raised, Chair. Thank you. In that case, I'll ask the applicants and the objectors to turn off their cameras and their microphones and I'll ask Werner to sum up. Thank you, Chair. I'll now conclude the presentation. As everyone is aware, the application site consists of vacant land within a residential area. The principle of a nursery being located within a residential area is considered to be acceptable in principle. However, it is necessary to ensure that any proposal is suitable for the location and that any technical issues can be satisfactorily addressed. The design and scale of the building is considered to be appropriate for this location and it's not considered to be overbearing or result in overdevelopment of the site. As part of the proposal, careful consideration has been given to the traffic impact of the development and associated parking requirements. This has resulted in the original application being amended to provide additional on-street parking. The impact of the development has been reviewed to communicate the service, specifically in terms of parking and traffic impacts, and they do not object to the proposal, subject to the imposition of suitable conditions. The overall impact of the development on both the natural and built environment at this location is considered to be acceptable. Overall, the proposal is considered to be acceptable since it complies with the relevant policies contained in the adopted and proposed local plans and it will not have an unacceptable impact on the amenity of the surrounding area. It is recommended that the application is approved, subject to conditions. Thank you, Any questions or comments? Couldn't hear what you said, Chair. Any questions or comments? Yes, well, the questions that we've been asking before of roads and regarding the, the con congestion, available parking, um, etc. I think this is a part of the meeting where we should be asking roads to comment on these. Is that correct? Thank you, Alice. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah. Obviously, the, the transport assessment has been undertaken by uh, the applicant's consultant. Um, we have reviewed that uh, transport assessment, um, and it's probably worthwhile just explaining how the, the, the kind of trips to the nursery were derived. Um, so essentially, the, there will be uh, 113 uh, kids attending the nursery. Um, of those 113 kids, we know that some have got siblings that will also be at nursery and also that some of the, the kids that would be attending the nursery would also be at Bodwell Primary School. Um, so what we were trying, what the TA had tried to demonstrate was the number of new trips that would be on the network um, as a result of the nursery. Um, that kind of concluded there was going to be um, essentially 54 new vehicle trips on the network. Um, between the peak hour period, uh, which does span uh, obviously when the primary school would go in. The question about congestion, I think, is kind of fairly typical around about primary schools um, because you've got so many people arriving at the same time, and generally you've got a 15 minute period where um, there is, you know, as it happens at, at most schools, that that, that kind of call it congestion does occur. Um, and I would acknowledge that that is the case. Um, the slight difference with the nursery is that the nursery will be operating, uh, the kids will be arriving anytime between eight o'clock in the morning and half past nine. Um, and also the, the, the staff for the nursery will be arriving before eight o'clock. Um, so Try and cut a long story short. I'm happy to, to be interrogated further if if so. If needed. But the 54 trips would arrive over that um, a long period. Um, that essentially breaks it down to roughly uh, 14 vehicles every 15 minutes. 
um, that would arrive. Now, we needed to make sure that what we were saying was robust and we visited um, similar nurseries to establish what the, the kind of parking patterns were like for nurseries that arrived between eight and nine o'clock or eight and a half past nine. Um, and it was quite evident that there is a kind of gradual increase. They don't, there isn't uh, specifically a, a very busy period. That it's just that the trips arrive um, on a, a kind of regular basis. So you don't get the same sort of issues that occur um, during a primary school. Um, and does that answer the question around congestion? Because uh, the, the, other, sorry, the other point to make is that um, at Clyde Terrace, um, there's a number of points that people can choose to exit the kind of residential area um, and the TA identified that um, a lot of the trips would actually go past the road that the primary school is on, uh, Blantyre Road, and head towards Blantyre Mill Road um, and, and therefore avoiding the kind of um, area that's typically more congested during the school period. Um, and the junctions were all um, seen to operate uh, well within capacity um, for, for the peak period, the peak network period, not the peak um, nursery period. Um, so that kind of paints a, a worst case scenario. Um, the other part of the, I'll come back to that, but the other part of the question, Fraser, was a, I'll rephrase it and ask you the percentage of the car parking area that is currently utilised, because we're not creating any more parking space, we're simply just making bays. What percentage of the area that can be used for parking is currently used. OK, I don't know the percentage wise, but I think it is probably worthwhile clarifying uh, what the proposals are. Um, Clyde Terrace um, has a relatively wide um, road uh, compared to that of a, a residential road. Um, you're somewhere between six and a half and seven metres, where a typical residential road is five and a half metres. Um, but also um, the footways or the pavements um, are typically kind of four metres wide, um, which is unusual for uh, a kind of residential area. And there's no houses on obviously the, the east side, the side opposite the nursery. Um, what, what has been proposed is that there would be 32 new lay-by parking, so they would be off the running carriageway. The carriageway would be clear at that point. Um, and that also the, the plans kind of show that the parking that currently exists um, for residents on Clyde Terrace would remain on street. Um, and typically the, the cars um, from our site observations can kind of show that some are um, parked uh, on the footway, some are parked fully on the carriageway, um, but that there is space for two-way traffic to be maintained. And, given the, the volume of traffic that's anticipated to be on the road, uh, we consider that there won't be any significant um, congestion happening on Clyde Terrace. OK, thank you. Did you say dry, yeah. No, Councillor Donnelly, their hand up first. Um, I don't know if this is appropriate, but I'm going to ask um, how far in did we go to look at the Apple Doe site? Because it had, it's been said by the opponents uh, that it has three times the size capacity than the one that we've chose for this site um, in Clyde View. Just um, as members know, um, when you're considering a planning application, you're considering this application on this site. Um, and, and I know it has been discussed through the Q&A and before. It isn't appropriate to talk about other sites. You're here to decide whether or not this is a suitable site for a nursery, um, not about other sites. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Pauline. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a, a 
a question for Fraser then. So we're moving the parking, but we're not actually increasing the number of spaces. We're just moving it to the, slightly to the side and formalising it. So if we've now got, if, as we've established, it's 25 full-time equivalent staff, which is obviously going to be more than that. So they're, you know, and if, if a majority of them are bringing a car um, and they're overlapping, um, do you actually think that there's going to be enough? I mean, in your opinion, do you think there's going to be enough car parking spaces for all the staff, all the residents that are currently parked there and for any parents that are dropping off and picking up? So your chair, um, yes, uh, we, we do. Um, the the TA suggests that there would be um, twenty staff um, arriving in the morning eight morning time. However, um, that would be split over shifts, and we have kind of discussed this that there would be approximately um, fifty percent of the staff would arrive before eight o'clock, and then. Roughly, uh, fifty percent would arrive after ten o'clock, which misses the the peak when the kids would be arriving. Um, so the TA allows for actually the full amount, twenty car parking spaces for staff, but we think um, that that would be a very robust assessment of it because it assumes that they would all be arriving. Um, in addition, uh, we have looked um, to ensure that it's a sort of robust. Uh, number we have looked at Westburn um, Nursery, uh, which operates at the moment with a very similar type of number, um, and we have carried out some surveys of our own. Uh, we found that there's um, 24 spaces provided at Westburn, um, and there was an overflow of about five. However, some of the spaces were actually free within the car park area. So numbers wise, um, we're quite confident that the the spaces that are being provided are is robust. And, and the last point is that the number of spaces that have been estimated as f for parents arriving is based upon a turnover of parents going in every 15 minutes. So it takes 15 minutes to drop the kid off, come back and then leave. Um, again, while we've been observing uh, what happens just now, um, we think that probably closer to five minutes is a turn around time for someone dropping off um, and certainly less than seven minutes when it comes to picking up because there is a wee bit more of uh, getting the kids ready to leave and, and go out. So there is more opportunity for a higher number of cars to um, you know, use the same space. Um, so I think it's a, a pretty sure it's a robust um, number of car parking spaces. So can I just ask another question? Are you basing that on um, like the spaces only being for the nursery? Are you accepting the fact that there's people already parked there? I mean, where are they going? I'm confused as to where they're going to go if they're already parked in the spaces. And, you know, they may not be in the, in the formalised spaces, but they are along the road at the moment. So where are they going? The, the existing residents would continue to park on street, uh, Councillor, and um, that's how it operates just now. Um, so with the, the volumes that are anticipated, um, I mean, there's a, it's, it's very typical in other areas uh, for parking on, on street within residential areas. Um, and having visited the site and seen the sort of traffic volumes, I'm uh, more than comfortable that there won't be any sort of congestion occurring there. Um, so there's not any additional parking for residents. However, there may actually be an opportunity for residents to park within the base on the opposite side of the road. Thank you, Basil. Any other questions? Yeah. Basil Yes. Right. And providing these parking spaces on the side opposite the nursery, you know, we're effectively reducing the width of the carriageway that exists at present. We're going to have a significant number of parents and children crossing the road. And that, you know, that 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 worries me that we're going to have a fairly congested street with traffic, where cars park both sides, and we're going to have at certain times of the day, a couple of hours in the morning, a couple of hours in the afternoon, a, a number of parents arriving with kids, parents leaving with kids, 
And you know, I, I'm not convinced that we're not creating a dangerous situation in terms of, you know, just simply crossing a road in a congested situation. Now, I did ask about the provision of a crossing. And I think the answer was that, that Vans gave us was that, that there would be a couple of crossings provided. You know, I'm assuming that these crossings would be markings on the road, it was spaced out along the length of the road. And in my experience, these or this type of crossing is not really effective in doing the job it's supposed to do. You know, was any consideration given to providing a light controlled crossing, a controlled crossing at the, the, the opposite the nursery, which people would use, as opposed to you know, painted crossings on the road, which in my experience, people don't use. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, the, the way the parking's been designed, um, essentially there's individual waybys. Um, in between the waybys, there is what we would call a build-out, which is a footway extension out, out towards the channel of the, uh, the, the road, the carriageway. Um, this build-out allows pedestrians to see beyond the parked cars and offers a safe place to cross. Um, we've also recommended a condition uh, which is included in the report um, for traffic coming um, to be introduced um, to slow traffic down and essentially it's to change the sort of environment of how the road uh, looks to the driver compared to what it is just now. Um, in terms of the, the nature of the crossing, um, it wouldn't be appropriate to provide a, a zebra crossing or a controlled crossing point in this location um, because the traffic volumes are, are too low. Um, and what that could mean is that um, people aren't used to the, the lights being uh, used and so drivers become um, wazzy. Uh, and, and also it's likely because the the traffic volume on the road is, is relatively light that pedestrians would be able to cross the road without um, needing to wait very long. So um, it wouldn't be appropriate to put in a, a, a controlled crossing or a zebra crossing of that nature, Council. But the traffic coming, um, which has been conditioned, would, would allow traffic speeds to be a lot lower at specifically at the crossing points. I hear what you say about the traffic volumes being low, but you're talking about traffic volumes over the day. What I'm talking about are traffic volumes which will vary during the day and will be particularly busy at certain times. You know, so where, where traffic volume on a road might not make a, a pedestrian crossing, you know, necessary, if that traffic is built up at certain periods of the day, then it might well justify a, a crossing. Yeah, I understand the council uh, the point you make there. Um, I would say that um, a car, and this is a very general point, um, but it kind of ties in with the observations that we we saw at the other nursery about the kind of constant. Um, the regular nature of, of how people generally arrive at nurseries um, and, and so I use this as a, an approximate value but you would be looking at um, roughly one car a minute passing for the nursery um, and through our on-site observations um, it was very easy to cross the road um, during the period between eight o'clock and, and half past nine um, so I, I don't anticipate it being um, you know, con congested in any way that would uh, require a controlled crossing point to be provided. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Uh, Chair Councillor Lennons gets hand raised. No, <clears throat> uh, no that's fine. Uh, never mind. Got no other hands raised just now, Chair. Thank you, Stuart. I'll move the report. I'll second it, Chair. 
Here can I give a report? I thought we'd been moving a deferral. Chair, Chair, yeah, there was a, an amendment moved. Well, I thought that was just before we decided we were going to have a few questions. Okay. Can we confirm if a Chair. deferral has been moved? Uh, uh, Chair, I, I can move a deferral as well. I mean, I know that Councillor um, McLaughlin has done, but I have a deferral here ready to move. Yeah, sorry, can I just um, clarify with Councillor McLaughlin? Um, you'd moved a deferral until a traffic impact assessment was carried out, is that correct? But I believe what I suggested was that we, 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 would, we would continue this hearing until we get more information from the traffic uh, and the roads officer. And I think quite a lot of what uh, has just been said has given the information we're needing. Uh, traffic volumes are too low, one vehicle per minute. It doesn't seem to me like it's a busy road. But that's what that's the kind of information that I've been looking for from the Roads Department. And I think we needed that in order to come to sort of make some sort of conclusion. But as it has been pointed out, the motion I made wasn't appropriate to be made at that time because we weren't in that position of and Pauline and has 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 clarified that. So I think my motion falls, but Graham Scott's motion is probably more appropriate now that we're in a different part of the discussion, different part of the meeting. This is a decision making part and the previous part was a hearing part. So I'm happy to withdraw that. Thank you, Chair. They say I, I've got to be honest, this, this is the first hearing we've had for a long while. And I've got to be honest, it got horribly bogged down. And I don't think it's done, as someone who's always been a uh, supportive of hearings, I don't think it's done the cause of hearings any good because it got the, the question and answer sessions it basically turned into the debate that we probably should have been having now. So, but uh, I think obviously in terms of the education department, I think they have proved their point that there, there is a, a need for a nursery in the Erdington Boyle area beyond any doubt. The only problem, and I take the point my colleague, Councillor McLaughlin uh, states, is that the traffic and also, I'd like to raise uh, the site selection process, I think, left something to be desired. That's why I'm prepared to move a deferral on the grounds of a report to be brought back to committee. I would, I would suggest something like eight weeks to review the entire site selection process with reasons for and against the sites considered chosen or rejected and to include transport and roads issues. I do believe that's given the, the sterility of the, the way things ended up today, that I'd like to think that would be a solution and again, get, get everyone back around and provide more information on the site selection process and uh, the roads impact assessment and more detail could come forward at a future date. So I'm prepared to move that. Hopefully there'll be a seconder for that. I'm happy to second Councillor Nalem. Thank you so much. Okay, well, you want to come in? Um, sorry, yeah. Chair, can I just come in? Um, I, I note that it's now 12 o'clock. Um, as previously intimated by the Chair, I would ask that all persons present please observe a minute's silence to mark the National Day of Reflection on the first anniversary of the first UK COVID lockdown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Hey. Yeah, I was actually going to come in and second Graham's 
suggestion. I'm a little bit concerned about this over, of, overall. Um, I'm not sure about the site, but I'm not sure that that's part of the planning criteria either. That's why I was asking the question earlier about the location. We are supposed to take on board the application in front of us, but because this is a council application, and I didn't really get an answer at the Education Committee. I think Graham's suggestion of a deferral to let us see what the alternative sites are and why they aren't, aren't been considered would be a good one and would be supportive of that. Chair, can I just, uh, Geraldine McCann's wanting to come in, if that's appropriate just now. Geraldine. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Allison rightly said that the suitability of different sites is not an issue for the Planning Committee. That would be a, an issue for the Education Committee. It's the suitability of this site uh, that um, Planning Committee have to consider. Um, so it wouldn't be appropriate to defer to get information on alternative sites, but further information on this site, if planning committee require it, TIA, if planning committee require it, that's a different issue. Thank you, Chair. Supplementary, Chair. Sorry, just to clarify, Geraldine, where my position was, I accept what you're saying, but because the council is the applicant here, I think we perhaps need to go that extra mile um, at the Education Committee, I asked the question and was told that it was up to planning. So therefore, I think we do need to have somewhere in this process a proper, not a proper, give us members an understanding of the site selection process. Couldn't do it to education, they suggested here. Um, so that's why I think we do need a deferral to get that area sorted out. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I wasn't at the Education Committee when it was considered. Um, my view was would be that it would have been appropriate for um, Education Committee members to ask um, for information on alternative sites before they approved this site. Um, planning Committee has a different role, so Planning Committee have to weigh up against the planning criteria whether this site is suitable because um, it can't take account of alternative sites. Thank you, Geraldine. You're on mute, Maureen. Oh, right. Sorry, I was it was just to second Graham's amendment. I should have taken my hand down. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would agree with Councillor Allison that um and the and the circumstances that we're specifically faced with here, um that that it would be good to, you know, have have this gone away and come back um with a bit more information as far as other sites go. Um, I am concerned about the fact that we've got this number of objections and that there is a petition, et cetera, around it as well. Um, it seems very much to go against what the community wants. And that is a big, big concern for me. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, members, just be before you get to the vote for, for deferral, um, just a few things, because I think some of the salient planning issues have got a bit lost in the debate today. Um, I, I do agree with, with 
Geraldine, that um, debates about alternative site doesn't sit with the planning committee. And I know that it's clouded by the fact that the education authority, another part of the council, is the applicant. And maybe that debate should happen, but I don't think it's appropriate for the planning committee. And the planning committee is to decide whether this site is suitable for a nursery. Um, and, and members, I have to tell you, in my view, the professional views of the planners having weighed up all the issues, we think it is a suitable site. It's a brownfield previously developed site in an urban area um, close to houses, which is exactly the kind of site where you would build a nursery. Um, I, I take it that, and, and take on board the fact that, that members are, are concerned about the number of objections, um, and there are a lot of objections to this, but I, I need to point out to members that multiple objections come from the same households um, with um, 27, in fact, with, with several households commenting two, three, four, and even five times. So if you take that into account, there's also comments that there are no letters of support. I think members are aware that it's very, very rare that we do get letters of support um, on behalf of planning applications. Um, it tends to be the, the, the people that live locally who comment and they tend to object. In fact, we, when we do get letters of support, I think we comment specifically because it is so unusual. I do take into account that the um, traffic assessment is to a certain extent hypothetical because there isn't a nursery on that site at the moment. So it's based on hypotheses, but it's based on hypotheses um, of experience of, of schools and nurseries elsewhere in South Lanarkshire, traffic patterns, the, the, the movements of the staff, the movements of the parents dropping off the kids, um, how many will drive, how many will walk to the site. So it's based on robust evidence as well, Chairman. Um, and, and I think, you know, the bearing in, in mind, you will all, I'm, nearly, I'm sure nearly all members will get your ears bent about traffic congestion on schools and nurseries in your own wards. Um, and I have to say, no matter how many parking spaces are created and drop-off points, um, that is no substitute for human behaviour. Um, and I think, there, is there any such thing as an ideal site? No. But but just to, to reiterate, Chairman, as far as we're concerned, it's a good and, and eminently suitable site for a nursery. And the 25 houses on one side of that street will be inconvenienced by it. But it's a nursery, Chairman, work um, with small kids and their parents through the, the working day. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair, 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 can, can I make a marginal amendment to, to conform with what Geraldine... Councillor Scott, your microphone's on to mute. Sorry, somebody else put it on to mute. Sorry. I just want to make a, a point that I can, to conform with what Geraldine has said, I'm prepared to marginally amend my deferral motion uh, to make it uh, see, conform with what uh, Geraldine has said in terms of making it street legal. And of course, uh, I think it's important that we have a deferral to consider today. So I'm certainly prepared uh, to amend my wording, uh, if you wish, to conform with what Geraldine has asked for in terms of the broader site selection process. I take that point, but I would obviously ask education officials uh, and again, to amplify the point that Councillor Allison has made, this this is a discussion that may have to take place at education, but it has to take place. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Walker. Um, is that me you're talking to? I hope so. Yes. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I have to say that I want to wind the spool back. I quite understand what uh, Pauline and Geraldine are saying, but I do support what Councillor Allison has been making as the key point here. And I think that um, we're putting the cart before the horse. We're trying to reach a planning decision when I don't think the education department have necessarily thought this through yet. And if we are required to follow it, the form or the pattern of what has to happen exactly, and we're only voting on planning, I would be prepared to move that planning is completely denied at this point, in which case it'll have to be sent back to um, education, perhaps, and the council to decide whether this site is suitable. I think we have to look at the overall picture, and I support 
um, what Councillor Scott is saying, but uh, equally with um, Alec Allison's extra bit as well. So I'm frankly not happy that um, you do not go back and discuss this in greater detail, looking at alternative sites and trying to work out a better solution. It strikes me also that you're only dealing with half the problem. This is only going to be enough space for 115 odd children when you, I'm told there's more than two or 300 that are looking for spaces. So I'm generally unhappy that this has come forward at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, I think there's an issue with your mic. I don't know what you, you just said there, whether you're asking for questions or maybe other members are the same, but every now and again your, your, your voice seems to fade and we can't hear. It's really important we hear what the Chair is saying. I agree, Debbie. I can't hear Isabel at all. Sorry, was asking Councillor Donnelly to come in? Yeah, Councillor Donnelly, you're on mute. Councillor Donnelly, you're on mute. Councillor Donnelly, you're on mute. Right, right now, at this moment, I'm seriously uncomfortable what way I would be going. Um, and like Councillor Callaghan, I'm seriously concerned the amount of objections that have signed the petition. And it would be then seen that we're going against a community feeling. Um, and they did say that they still supported a nursery. And... I would be looking for guidance where we go if we don't pass this. OK, thank you. George, you want to come in at that point? Sorry, Chair, um, I think that's maybe more one for Pauline at this point. OK, someone's got their hand up. Thanks, Chair. Um, can, can, can I come in? Um, I, I was um, about to put a message in the comments here. This is the, the difficulty about being online. You can't wave your hands and do things like that at people. Can I just suggest, Chair and members, to move this forward, that we accept the amendment on the planning relevant issues, which the, um, the application has deferred for a more robust look at the transport and parking issues and it be brought back to that committee. But the committee make a, a recommendation to the education and other committees and the council that they do revisit the sites out with the planning process because that isn't part of the planning process. But I do understand members just quiet about that. And I'm just trying to think here, members, of a constructive way forward on, on the matter if members are happy with it. Thanks, Chair. I would be happy with that. Yeah, I'd be happy with that as well. Do you agree? Agreed. 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 If we come back for 12.30, would that be okay with everyone? Yep, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Agreed. Chair. Agreed. 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 Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Agreed. 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 A planning application for the replacement of an existing sign. Um, it requires consent because it's changing to a LED sign, an LED sign at 99 Glasgow Road in Campus Line. The application relates to a 48 sheet externally illuminated advert that's there at the moment. Um, and as I say, it would change to a LED sign. This would allow the adverts to be upgraded and changed um, without visiting the site. Um, and that can be done uh, virtually. Mm -hmm. In terms of land use, the, the site is sits within the, the urban settlement and the as defined by the, the LDP. In terms of um, consultees, we, we consulted both roads and environmental services and neither had any objections, subject to conditions um, on behalf of environmental services. 
In terms of uh, neighbour notification uh, was carried out and there were seven letters of representation, representation objection received to the application. Um, and that included one from Margaret Ferrier MP and one from Claire Hawkey MSP on behalf of their constituents. Um, the concerns and the issues raised are set out in section five of the report. Um, the ones I would mention in particular are the concerns raised regarding um, firstly the site and the location of the sign. Um, the, the sign is, in the, is going to stay in the same place as it is at the moment. Um, and that is across the other side of the main road from the residential develop, uh, uh, residences. And it's uh, staying at the same angle. It, it sits roughly um, at right angles to the road um, and obviously targeting the, the passing um, pedestrians but, and probably more likely drivers. Um, and it's the change of the type of, as I said, um, type of advert rather than the changing the, the location or, or the size. There have been uh, concerns raised about amenity, and that stems from any light um, that would emanate from the sign. Um, as I said, environmental services had no objection subject to luminance level, which we would attach as a condition if, if members approve. Um, so in terms of amenity, we don't have a concern because of the distance um, across the road. Glasgow Road is a busy main road, and the sign sits on the opposite side of the road, and as I say, it's roughly at right angles to the road, so it's not directly facing any of the windows or or the balconies there. Um, so on that basis, we're we're happy that it's it, it would be okay. Um, and danger to traffic um, as well. It's not unusual for these uh, lead lead signs of this type. Um, and as long as the evidence level is um, is conditioned. Uh, then and the duration of each advert is is conditioned. Then um, roads and environmental services are, are happy with that. Um, so on that basis, chair, um, we're recommending approval of the sign. Thank you, Tina. Any questions or comments for Tina? I'll move the report. I'll second it, chair. Agreed. The report. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, thank you. We'll take items five and six together. That's application P20-1751 and P20-1752 and pages 41 to 78. And Bernard will take us through these items. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll address both of these together and as they relate to the same development. Item five seeks planning permission, whilst item six seeks listed building consent. Both applications relate to the B-listed plan up grammar annex. The original building dates from 1883 with two later additions being added a short time later. The site sits within a predominantly residential area, a short distance from the town centre. The building has unfortunately been vacant since 2003 and is beginning to fall into a dilapidated condition. The proposal seeks to retain the original building with bell tower and demolish the later additions. The retained building would be restored and converted to accommodate eight two and three bedroom flats. Following demolition and site clearance, the eastern section of the site would be developed with the erection of a mixture of flats and terrace dwellings, totalling 31 new build units. These new build units would cross fund the restoration and conversion of the listed building. The flats would all contain two bedrooms and the terraced houses three bedrooms. The new build units would be relatively modern in appearance, reflecting the original features of the Lanark Grammar Annex and would be finished in facing brick and zinc clad. In total, there would be 39 social housing units on site and 42 parking spaces. Vehicular access would be via Braxfield Road. In both the adopted and the proposed plans, the site is identified as part of the general urban area and the principle of a residential development at this location is acceptable. Since the site was vacated in 2003, there have been a variety of proposals put forward. Temporary classrooms were on site at one time, whilst a previous consent for the conversion of the listed building for residential purposes was also granted. In addition, the site was also considered for retail, but that never progressed to an actual application as it would have likely involved the complete demolition of the listed building. The site is identified in the Council's Strategic Housing Investment Programme as being suitable for a total of 49 units. The consultation responses are summarised in section four of the report and no objections have been raised subject to the use of appropriate conditions. 
There have been 17 letters of objection, two comment letters and one letter of support in relation to this application. No letters have of sorry, no letters of objection have been submitted in relation to the listed building application. The main issues raised relate to traffic, parking, scale and design of the development and the general impact of the development both during and after construction on the amenity of the surrounding area. Both the planning application and listed building application have been carefully considered. Whilst it is never ideal to permit part of a listed building to be demolished, in this instance, it is considered to be justified. The proposal would see the original building retained, and this compromise is preferred to the whole building continuing to fall further into disrepair. A degree of compromise is therefore considered to be acceptable in this instance. The proposed use of the site for a residential development is considered to be acceptable at this location. The retention of the most significant part of the listed building is to be welcomed, and its sympathetic restoration is acceptable. Whilst the new build element will contrast with the listed building and nearby Victorian era properties, the design, scale and finishing materials proposed are considered to be acceptable. Sufficient parking would be provided within the site and a suitable access formed. The site occupies a prominent location and its redevelopment would not only prevent further deterioration in the fabric of the listed building, but also enhance the visual amenity of the surrounding area. On balance, the partial demolition of the listed building is considered to be acceptable in this instance. It is therefore recommended that both planning permission and listed building consent be approved subject to conditions. Thank you, Bernard. Any questions? I'll move agenda item five. I'll agree that. Chair. Sure. We agree the report? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. And I'll move agenda item six. I'll second that, Chair. Agree the report? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Moving on to agenda item seven. That's application P20-1661. And that's in pages 79 to 88. And Tina will take us through item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is an applying application for the change of use of a strip of agricultural uh, land to the side of the house, the forum garden ground, the erection of a rear extension and side extension for a garage at 16 South End Court in Spaven. Um, the application, uh, sorry, the applicant has um, bought a, an area of land to the side of his house, approximately 85 square metres, um, and wants to take that in as garden ground. Um, the application, as I said, also relates to an extension to the rear of the property, um, which measures approximately 30 square metres um, as a, for a new family room. And the proposed extension to the side is, is for a, a garage. Mm. In terms of the LDP, it is um, within the, the house is within and the garden is currently within the residential area. However, the strip of land that they want to take into the, the plot is currently Greenbelt as it's out with the, the village settlements. In terms of um, representations, um, we have received um, four letters um, of representation as set out in section five of the report. There are concerns about the use of agricultural land for garden grounds. Um, however, in terms of planning, um, it is a, it is a, a relatively um, limited strip of ground. Um, and it doesn't set a precedent because it is at the end of, of the cul-de-sac and um, rather than the middle of a, a row of houses. Um, and having looked at, at it on site, it, it, it looks fine. Um, the, the post and wire fence um, has already been moved. So in, in um, this part of the application is actually in retrospect. Um, but the, the, there's no, there's not been any building work, so the, the extension at the back and the garage um, are have not been undertaken. Um, in terms of the the proposal for the the side and rear extension, um, they are single storey and appropriate design and materials. And, and given its orientation in relation to the properties, it's not considered to adver have an adverse impact on the adjacent property um, and therefore acceptable in planning terms. Um, therefore, in conclusion, uh, Chair, we are um, recommending approval 
Um, the, the strip of land would be development contrary to development plan because it's it's actually encroaches out with the, the village settlement. But we think that um, in our view that that is OK in terms of, of this application for the reasons set out in paragraph 6.8 of the, the report. Um, and the, 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 as I said, the, the part of the application for the extension and the garage are also considered acceptable. So therefore recommending approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Peter. Any questions or comments for Peter? Council Nealon? Uh, yeah, just a, a, a slight technical question. <clears throat> in the um, items for decision um, for, the, for the actual um, contents of the paper, um, it contains the word retrospective, and yet the heading for the actual proposal for the agenda item in the papers doesn't contain the word retrospective. Um, it misses it out completely in relation to the change of use. Um, I, what, I just wondered why that was. Thank you. I'll let you answer that. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, through you, Chair. Um, there's no, no nothing deliberate. I think the the description of the proposal is put forward by the applicant, um, but it was clear dealing with the application that that part was retrospective. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll move the report. I'll second it, Chair. Thank you. The report. Agreed. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item eight, application P201730, and pages 89 to 126. And Tony will take us through the item. Thank you, Tony. Sorry, Chair, I wasn't unmuted. Um, so this application is being made to the Scottish Government under Section 36 of the Electricity Act. It's for the erection of 21 turbines with a height up to 200 metres um, and associated infrastructure um, at Cumhead Farm. The installed gen turbine generation capacity would be approximately 126 megawatts and there'd be an additional potential on-site battery storage capacity of 40 megawatts. So in this case, the government is the consenting authority and the council are a statutory consultee in the process. So the application sites um, approximately just over a thousand hectares in area uh, comprises mainly of the western portion of Cumhead Forest and um, the site's located approximately 1.5 kilometres to the south of Colburn and 2.6 kilometres to the northwest of Douglas and um, it's in an area where there's several wind farms either in operation under construction or consented but not uh, yet built out. The current application site is immediately north of the consented Cumberhead Wind Farm, and, and to the southeast are the operational Mutbury and the consented Dalquandy Wind Farms. Um, there's also operational wind farms at Gala Whistle and Hagshaw, plus its extension uh, to the south and th southeast. And collectively, this um, these wind farms comprise what is known as the Hagshaw Cluster. And the planning history that's led to the creation of this is described in section 3.3.1 of the report. Vehicle access to the site is proposed from an existing private access road which extends from the public road at the roundabout at Junction 11 on the M74 and that runs past the John Dewitt bonded warehouse. A new link is proposed to join with the existing Hall Road onto, um, into an existing network of uh, access tracks. The access tracks would require upgrading, but it should be noted that the majority of these works are shared between other wind farm developments with only a small final portion uh, required to be um, made up to connect to the turbine area. No objections have been received from consultees and no representations have been made following the carrying out of publicity. So a detailed assessment of the proposals against national strategic and local development plan policy is set out in section six of the report. It's noted, noted firstly that the majority of the site is located within the areas with potential for wind farm development, which is identified in diagram six of Clyde Plan, which is the strategic development plan for the area. In terms of local plan policy, policy 18 is, is the key um, uh, policy mechanism for um, assessing these kind of applications. Um, it, it, it links into the principles set out in the uh, uh, Scottish government's policy in Sp Scottish planning policy uh, granted in 2014. So just turning to some of the main points, um, the site's located within the rolling moorland landscape character type. Um, and the, 
our uh, landscape capacity for wind turbines guidance um, says it's individual and cumulative impact um, impact of wind farms and wind farm developments will be acceptable generally in moorlands. The immediate landscape surrounding the application site are several operational and concentrated wind farms, as I said before. The landscape and visual impact assessment, therefore, has also looked at the cumulative impact with them um, with, with other existing concentrated wind farms. So this cluster, the Hackshaw cluster, is identified in figure 5.2 in the Council's SPG on renewable energy. And this figure has been included to demonstrate the need to ensure that the existing cluster is um, doesn't significantly extend, or it's, it doesn't prevent a potential coalescence with, between groups. So the Hackshaw cluster is to be detected from extending too far to the north to avoid visual cre creep with um, development at Kite Muir. But in this case, it's considered that the application site, it's on the northwest edge of this cluster, but it would distinctly relate to the Hackshaw cluster itself and be associated with a forestry surrounding, surrounding Nutbury Hill. And um, we're quite satisfied that it would be still adequate separation from the Kite Muir clusters. Um, the application site's also located with an area that's identified as having medium capacity for wind turbines at this scale. Um, it states, however, the landscape study states, however, that due to the modest scale of landforms, taller turbines might have an adverse visual or adverse scale effects if not carefully sited. But in this case, um, we think that the, the, um, the proposed larger turbines would be perceived as an extension to the existing cluster. Um, we're satisfied that there'd be no impact on the residential amenity of either individual dwelling houses or local communities. And we've also assessed the application against um, impact on environmental designations and also um, historic and built heritage designations such as scheduled monuments and listed buildings. And we're satisfied there'd be no adverse impact on these uh, features. So the recommendation is therefore not to object to the application. Should the council have no objection to the amended proposals, it's recommended that this is on the basis it would be expected that a legal agreement covering the issues detailed on the front page of the report, which includes um, ensuring contributions are made to the uh, Renewable Energy Fund, uh, would be concluded. Over to you, Chair. Thank you, Johnny. Any questions or comments, Johnny? Chair, Councillor Waters, get his hand raised. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, one comment, one question. I'm pleased to see that there's a storage facility attached to the wind farm. I don't think any wind farm should be getting approval unless there is some form of storage. It's the only thing that makes sense with wind farms. But my question is, the, there's a contribution to the Renewable Energy Fund, and it says a, a, the funding of a planning officer. Um, are those separate? Or is it the funding of the planning monitoring officer going to be deducted from what would be a normal contribution to the REF? In other words, you know, the funding of a planning monitoring officer, that's a that's a council expenditure, if you like. It shouldn't be coming from at the expense of the normal contribution to the renewable energy fund. Yeah, just to answer Councillor Wardour through you, Chair. Yes, there are two separate issues. Um, the planning monitor officer would be involved in, um, first of all, discharging planning conditions, and also when construction work starts on site, ensuring that it's being carried out in accordance with the approved plans and conditions. Um, so it is a, a entirely separate matter from the uh, Renewable Energy Fund contributions. Sorry, could I clarify? Normally we get, I can't remember what the, offhand what the figure is, uh, a contribution per per megawatt or whatever. Now that's a fixed contribution that we require from from any wind farm development. Uh, so we are getting that, but in addition, we're getting a contribution to fund a planning monitoring officer, or is a planning monitor officer contribution coming from what would be the normal contribution? That's really what I'm trying to distinguish between the two. Yeah. Right. They're both listed, but what will go to the Renewable Energy Fund will be what would normally go to the Renewable Energy Fund, whether or not there was a an additional uh, funding of a, a monitoring officer. Yes, yeah, sorry, Councillor Wardour. Um, so the, 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 the contribution, if you like, or towards a planning monitor officer, 
we, we normally employ um, a third party consultant to do that work for us and um, the applicant pays those fees directly um, to, to the consultant to, to do that work. There'd be no impact whatsoever on the contribution they make to the REF. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I'll move the report. I'll second it, Chair. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item nine, application P20 1838. That's from pages one to eight to one, sorry, one to seven to one three eight. Then Bernard will take us to item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Permission is sought for the change of use of a vacant public house to a retail unit with associated external alterations. The planning application site relates to a traditional two-storey building, which is situated in a prominent corner location between Glasgow Road and Stonefield Road, Blantyre. The site comprises the ground floor of the existing sandstone property, which was constructed around about 1903. The site is situated within the general urban area, within close proximity to Blantyre Town Centre. The proposal is for the unit to accommodate a class one retail use, which will include the sale of fresh cold food, such as sandwiches, and a dessert bar for consumption off the premises. The proposed development will accommodate a retail area, back of house area, manager's office, staff area and toilet facilities. The proposed external alterations include the replacement of the existing main access door to the retail unit and existing windows with aluminium powder coated framing glaze system. In addition, the proposal includes the closure of two of the entrances to the existing public house. The planning application site is designated as part of the general urban area in both the adopted and emerging local development plan, so therefore raises no land use issues. No consultations were required. In terms of representations, there have been 61 objections to the proposal. And the main issue raised concerns the loss of the public house, which is viewed to contribute to the local community and it has been in existence for many years. In particular, it's been described as being very much at the heart of the local community and used as a, a meeting area by local residents. The applicant has submitted information in support of their application, which identifies that the existing unit has been marketed for reoccupation since 2019 as a public house, due to it being considered as an underperforming asset. The correspondence establishes that within the last two years, whilst there have been nine viewings of the property, none of these have progressed and the only interest was as, as use as a retail unit. So consequently, that's the owner has proceeded to submit this application. It's noted that the public house has historically played a, a role within the entire community. However, it's considered to be an unviable business in the longer term. Consequently, the proposal for conversion to retail would ensure the occupation of the existing building, provide some employment, and it is in close proximity to Blantyre Town Centre. The proposed retail use and associated external alterations are acceptable at this location and will not have a detrimental impact on the amenity of the surrounding area. The proposals comply with the relevant policies contained in both the adopted and proposed local plans, and it is recommended that planning permission is granted. Thank you, Bernard. Any questions? Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, um, the sound went dead for a second. My apologies. Uh, first of all, just to make a few points on this. Uh, I mean, I have absolutely no problem with the fact that it's a, a conventional store and we'll have a long-term problem ahead of us after the, during the COVID crisis and the fact that I believe that this pub closed at the start of the COVID crisis last year and will not reopen. I think we'll have a problem with other licensed, former licensed premises down the road on, on that and we'll have to address that. But the, the point I really want to concern is I see I've no, I'm not going to oppose this, but it's a fact the traffic aspect of this junction Obviously, if you look at the map on page 138, right across the road from it, and by the way, Glasgow Road is a main thoroughfare through Blantyre. You have St. Joseph's Church, you have St. Joseph's Hall. 
you have uh, just down the road, you have the the junction taking vehicles down to Blanter Station. I don't want to re relive the the debate we had when the hub, the social work hub at the back of St Joseph's came to planning, but I know I raised the deferral at that point because there was going to be traffic concerns. We are adding another convenience store to an area where there is considerable traffic problems, and at some point we'll need some sort of look at in terms of another traffic impact assessment, because as I say, you have a church, a hall, the the social work hub, the road down to the station, all attracting large amounts of traffic. And I think this junction, given the fact it's a thoroughfare through Blantyre, I think there's going to be problems ahead. And I think the planning department and roads will have to have a look at some kind of traffic plan uh, going down the road, no pun intended, in relation to this area. But as a convenience store on its own, I also I welcome the application. But I do think there are problems ahead, given the, the amount of volume of traffic on that junction. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Do you want to come up please? N nothing to add, just to say uh, to Councillor Scott that those comments are noted and obviously any future applications that we get, either in that specific area or that may have an impact on the infrastructure, we'll duly note that and obviously we'll liaise with roads accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Thompson. Hey, thanks, Chair. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Hello. Yeah, right. Just say basically reiterate what was, and I'm a great believer you shouldn't be saying what other people say, but it's so important. There's no car parking in that area. The only car parking is already used with uh, shops that are there, and the pub that's there. Uh, there's got to be fast food, uh, no fast food, but uh, people going in for pick up uh, maybe a delicatessen or whatever. So there's got to be cars parking there, maybe five, ten minutes or taxis, get in and out. And it's right at a junction. A, a junction is very, very busy with road and the uh, main access to uh, Blantyre, Glasgow and Hamilton. There's no car parking. There's a uh, accommodation above this property as well. That's all the negatives, which might be resolved by a right thorough look at traffic management in the area that I think is needed. And, and as Councillor Scott says, there's the new hub, there's St Joseph's and another place of worship there as well. So there are concerns about traffic, but on the plus side, Rather than an empty building, somebody's willing to, in this day and age, to go in and put money in and invest in the business is welcome and it'll continue employment. So they've got pluses, but I would certainly like some look at traffic in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no other questions? I'll move the report. No second it, Chair. Agreed the report. Agreed. Great. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 10, application P20-1665 and page 139 to 152. And Tina will take us for the item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a planning application for a change of use from a dry cleaners, which is, falls within class one in planning terms, to a hot food takeaway, um, which is sui generis at 36 Kirkton Park in East Kilbride. Um, just before I go into the report, we have received um, two late objections, both from local members. We received an objection from Councillor Fagan on Friday, um, and Councillor Fagan's grounds of objection are largely based on the road and traffic issues, um, which is already covered in the report and, and we will come on to. Um, Councillor Fagan's asking that the planning application be refused on, on that basis. The other representation we received yesterday from Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Ferguson's objection is also um, on parking and roads grounds um, as, as the main concern. He attached um, some photos um, that I just saw uh, last night, um, but these were taken last Friday um, just to indicate that there was some double parking. Um, and I think there was someone on a, a yellow line as, as well. But Councillor Ferguson's um, objection is, is on the, the parking and, and roads grounds uh, too. Just returning to the, the report itself, um, the application site um, is within a small row of shops, um, six units, um, just on the edge of East Kilbride Village. 
in terms of the LDP, um, as set, set out in Section 3 of the report, um, it is within the, the village settlement and within the, the commercial area of, of the village. Turning to consultations, we consulted roads and, and roads have had a, a big um, input into this. Um, there's been a lot of discussion. Um, they've concluded that they have no objections to the proposal, um, having looked at it in, in a lot of detail and looking at the parking that's available. There's a bank of 10 spaces available to the front of the shops um, and there's also parking to the rear. Um, so you, if you drive around the side of, of the units, um, then there's, there's an informal parking area to the back, which is also for these shops. Um, roads also comment that there is um, another bank of, of uh, parking spaces just around the corner, um, approximately 120 metres away in Stuart Street in, in the village. Um, so they would all be available. We've also looked at the timing and the, there is a, a Greg's um, within the, the row of shops. There's a local deli and there's also an Indian restaurant. Um, roads have looked at what was likely to be open at, at night. Um, they've looked at the peak period for a carryout um, facility, although it would be open from lunchtime uh, roughly 12 till 12. Um, it's around you know, seven to, to eight is, is the is the peak time, um, and at that time the, the the Greg's Bakery, the Deli, and the Laundry would all be would all be closed. So they've taken all of that into consideration um, and have no objections to the, the the proposal. Environmental services have no objections, and um, subject to standard conditions regarding ventilation. And the final consultee, East Mains uh, Community Council, they do object to the proposal. And again, it's on the basis that concentration of traffic for a hot food takeaway uh, would exacerbate um, the problems that already, in their view, exist in, in the area. While all of that is, is noted, um, both the Council's Environmental Services and our Road Services are recommending that the application be uh, approved or have no objections to it. Um, as set out in, in section four of, of the report. Turning to representations, I, mean, I mentioned the two from local members, but we also have 32 um, separate um, uh, pieces of correspondence and objections to the, to the proposal and the points of concern are set out in section five. Again, I have to say that the main issue is problems with, with traffic. Um, However, um, there is parking available to the to the front of the units, as I say, and people come and go um, from these ten units from sorry ten parking spaces. There's additional parking to the rear, um, and the the parking I mentioned round in in uh, Stuart Street. Mm. The hours of opening that has been mentioned and talk about antisocial behaviour and, and noise. Most of that would be for for the police if it was antisocial behaviour. However, the hours of opening um, could be controlled further under the operating licence if it was approved by planning. Just turning to our conclusions, the hot food takeaway is considered to be an appropriate use in a neighbourhood centre. It's considered it would be compatible with the existing use um, as a neighbourhood centre. And on that basis, it's not considered that um, it to be an inappropriate uh, proposal. It's not considered that it would have a significant adverse impact on adjacent uh, properties in terms of residential amenity. Um, it, is a, it is one of a, a number of commercial units that already exist there. Um, and as I've said, um, we've got, we have no objections from the, the consultees. So on that basis, we're recommending approval here. Thank you, Gina. Whose hand was up first, Stuart? Yeah, Councillor Water. Thank you, Councillor Water. Yeah. Yeah. I've got problems with this one in terms that we have an existing business which is which is operating. As far as I know, it seems to be operating fairly successfully, not under the current circumstances, but you know before the the pandemic. And we've got a problem in the village in East Kilbride, and uh, every time, you know, on a regular basis, we get applications for change of use to a food outlet of some kind and it, you know it's killing the village the village needs footfall during the day and dry cleaner 
gives footfall during the day. But when you go to takeaways, that tends to be a nighttime activity only. And I, I really think that the village is suffering now from the, the, the number of takeaways and food outlets that we've got in the village and other services which people visit the, the village for just fall by the wayside. And I would also say that there is some sheltered housing near near the you know the the site. And that's when you're going to get complaints from people being disturbed at night. They don't, they don't mind the dry cleaners during the day, that's fine, but nighttime activity is something that impinges on sheltered housing particularly. Do you want to come back in? Uh, yes, um, you know, I acknowledge what Councillor Ward was saying about the number of, of takeaways. I mean, in that role, um, although this would be a change of use from the dry cleaners, there, there would be a remaining laundrette. Um, and during the day, um, it would be the, the Greggs and, and, and the deli, um, which, are, which are closed in, in the evening. Thank you, Councillor Scott. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to agree with uh, many of the points made by Councillor Wardhall and uh, to give notice that uh, uh, I will be moving a refusal on this and I'll give you my reasons why. Again, very similar to what Councillor Wardhall has said. Uh, you will have four hot, if this goes ahead, you will have four hot food takeaways and five doors. You'll have an Indian restaurant, Greg's, the deli, the laundromat, God bless it, and of course the this new one here. That'll be four and five doors. I know over provision is a term used for licensing, but certainly that would again the point uh, Councillor Wardhall made clear over provision in an area where if you go round the corner onto Stuart Street, there's a, I think there's two chippies and another uh, bakery round there. So there is plenty of uh, hot food takeaway choices. Uh, for the kids coming down from St Andrews and St Brides at lunchtime. Another point I want to make is, if you go round the corner to Maxwell, Maxwell Drive is basically a one-way system. If you're using the Baptist Church or the or Corns, the, the, the DIY shop or the theatre, that's a one-way system and the car parking and the, the units in there. When you come out, you've got to go to the left and to get back out onto Main Street, You've got to drive by uh, this row of shops. So there is a large amount of general traffic usage along the front of this. And it's uh, a regular occurrence, people reversing in and out of the hot food takeaways, uh, a tailback of traffic because it's a, div a divert around. Another point, and I know uh, Pauline, before Pauline comes in and says, no two planning applications are the same. I, uh, I accept there may be a precedent here in terms of the refusal that we moved a couple of meetings ago. I think it was down in Stone Law Road in Burnside when we had the pet shop and uh, we refused the, the, I think it was an estate agent. And again, the argument that was used very ably by my colleague, uh, Councillor Cowie, and to be fair by Councillor Nugent, was that they don't need another estate agent down there when a pet shop is obviously a, a shop of value. I think that this could be, except the differences, but there are a, a general principle that is common to both. Uh, and that was a refusal and committee sought well to, to refuse that. So uh, without further ado, Chair, I'll move refusal uh, of this item on the grounds of traffic considerations and of course, over provision of hot food takeaway, I'm allowed to use that one, but certainly on general traffic volume and considerations uh, in a village area. Thank you, Chair. Hopefully I'll have a second there for that. I'll, I'll second. second it. I'll second chair. it. No, that's fine. <laughs> Councillor Wardhall. Thank you, Chair. Um, I yes. I have a couple of issues yeah, at this location. Yeah, the, the traffic issue, I, I'm, I'm in the village every day for various reasons. We're bringing a, we're, we're, the pier, we're bringing a food establishment off the main 
from the main drag in towards the housing. I mean, there's a house, uh, if I remember right, just a few metres from the gable end of this property. There's one across the road from it. You've got sheltered housing further along. I would be concerned, particularly if it's got a 12 o'clock licence or if it's allowed to open to 12 o'clock. Because by the time people finish there, you're talking about half 12. We're bringing a lot of noise into the village, and into the housing part of the village. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be supporting this one. Thank you. OK, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Councillor Craig? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, just, just to ask, uh, is there any planning reason why uh, if, well, first of all, uh, I take it that uh, the dry cleaners isn't being forced to close, they're, they're doing it of their own free will, they're, they're, uh, they're vacating the property. But secondly, if uh, that is the case and uh, the hot food takeaway uh, appeal this, what would what would be the, the outcome or what would be the grounds on which uh, we could object? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through, through yourself, Chair. Um, in terms of the, the dry cleaners, I don't know the background to the business. We are we're just asked to consider the, the change of use, which has been brought forward uh, to us. Um, in terms of the likelihood of appeal, I mean, in terms of traffic issues, because... Our oh, I think we've lost your sound. One of the councillors mentioned the, the, the pet shop, um, Councillor Scott, um, the pet shop in, in Burnside. And I think I said at that time that you know, we, we don't have a policy that um, would limit the, the number of any particular type of business within the commercial area. Um, so in terms of the actual number, um, we do have to consider amenity and roads issues. Um, just for members' information, the one at the pet shop at Stolmo Road has gone to appeal, so um, we will have an appeal for that one to deal with, or our legal colleagues will, um, on our behalf, but, um, on the council's behalf. But um, I can't really second guess what we, you know, we're bringing forward a recommendation approval because we don't think there are any planning reasons for for refusal of, of the application, um, and that's largely, as I say, on the basis that. Um, the consultees don't have any objections either. OK, thank you. Thank you, Gina. Uh, there's another hand up. Don't know who it is. Councillor. That's me, just, that's me coming in again. Yeah, the, the, there, are, there are planning reasons. I mean, there are the traffic issues. And, uh, you know, people who use that row of shops realise that very often it, it's cars reversing out at the wrong angle, you know, which makes it even worse. But there is a there is a possibility of the certainty that it will cause disruption to residents who at the moment have a dry cleaners which operates during the day, and that's going to be replaced by a hot food takeaway which will operate at night, in particular late 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 evening. And that, you know I think that that's sufficient grounds, and I would certainly support rejecting this application. Okay, thank you. Tina, do you want to come back in there? Uh, Chair, I, I think it might be more uh, appropriate for Fraser maybe to, to comment. Um, I, you know, I hear what people are saying in terms of we can, but I, I think we would need reason for refusals. And, and I, I think in terms of um, our Rhodes colleagues have advised that they think it will work okay. Um, sorry, Fraser, maybe could you comment? Fraser? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we looked at this one. Uh, it's a change of use. It's obviously an existing building there. Um, I think to be fair, if it was a, a, a new building, then it would have been additional traffic. Um, we we kind of came to the view that um, because there's other takeaways there, there might not necessarily be an increase in traffic. It might just be that uh, they, they have more options to choose from. Um, I think Possibly the pandemic has changed things a wee bit in the sense that there's um, more sort of your know, just eat type delivery um, uh, happening now than previously. Um, and 
because there's the parking restrictions around the area, that's something that could be managed. Um, I accept that it wouldn't be possible to have a parking attendant there 100% of the time, um, but at peak times that, that could be managed. Thank you, Fraser. Councilman Diver. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just want to support Councillor um, Scott, Councillor Wardhall. I mean, this is a, it's a really, really busy bit here. To add in another takeaway, um, whilst there's a business there already, that there's no ne not near the traffic there's going to be with a takeaway um, or for delivery. And whilst you're talking about like Just Eat, a lot of the, the takeaways are now moving to cheaper versions of doing their own deliveries, which is going to just be increased traffic. And that you mentioned the car park at the back. Good luck to you if you try to get parked in that because it's 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 extremely difficult. Um, it, it's tiny and, and there's lockups there. So um, I think really that there must be on planning grounds that there's just insufficient parking to to to, to for this takeaway for, for an additional takeaway in that one wee row. Yeah, thank you. I see another hand up. No, it's just just to say, it's significant that the, the councillors that have all raised objections to this are all East Kilbride councillors who use that area, and you know, I've used it for more years than I can remember. You know, and I, I really think it's an inappropriate change from a dry cleaner to a hot food takeaway, which brings disruption, especially in the evenings. To houses which at the moment don't have that disruption. Thank you, Councillor Lennon. Um, yeah, I would also like to um, support Councillor Scott's um, motion. Um, I think I would maybe phrase it slightly differently. I don't think it's a case of um, over provision necessarily, but I do think it's a case of cumulative impact um, and having several of these kinds of establishments in a short stretch. Like it does cause particular issues. And so I think that's something that we should be recognising um, through the planning process. Um, and in addition to that, what I would say is that you know, economic development is a legitimate planning ground. And so we should be taking what kinds of businesses are located where and what the cumulative impact of having particular concentrations um, in the context of particular um, urban surroundings really is. So, you know. Councillor Ward, I'll be reassured to hear that there is there's a, certainly at least one non East Kilbride councillor um, that is uh, opposing this change. Thank you. I see another hand up. I just point out that it's not so long ago, certainly when I joined the council, that we actually had a policy, a development policy in the village about how many restaurants we could have, how many non-retail outlets we could have, and that policy was kind of abandoned. But I still think it's a, it is an essential tool of planners to, to take that kind of consideration into account. I don't know why we dropped the, you know, the, the, the policy that we had before. I mean, it was at one point we had 35% non-retail, and then that became 40% non-retail. And God knows where it is now, but it is an issue. It is a planning issue. Okay, thank you. Is that Councillor Devlin? Is it myself, Chair? Yes. Sorry. Um, how many fast food places are in this area? Just out of curiosity. Uh, th through you, Chair, I, I don't know the overall number in, in the village. Um, what we've concentrated on is, is this row of, of shops, um, which has, uh, as I mentioned, it's, it has a, an Indian restaurant carry out, um, a deli, a Greg. Um, we've looked the role. I mean, maybe given some of the comments from members, maybe just to reassure you, I mean, we have looked at amenity um, as well as the roads issues, um, and it is a planning issue in terms of amenity. However, it is within the commercial area, 
um, and although it is the end of the row, it's still within within that area where you would expect businesses of this type. Um, so we didn't feel that, that the change of use of this one in particular um, was enough um, to warrant refusal of, of the application, combined with a uh, Rhodes colleagues being, being okay with it. Okay, thank you. There's another hand up. That's Councillor McLaughlin, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McLaughlin. Thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> a number of years back in, in my ward, an area uh, at Glasgow Road in Burnbank, where an application for a hot food takeaway was refused, and the applicant appealed, the appeal was upheld, and so the, the, the hot food takeaway was granted. But thereafter, any other applicants that came in um, got granted permission because we had tried to refuse one before and we lost that on appeal. And what's what's happened in that area is that section of shops is almost all hot food takeaway. And I don't think that's right. And I don't think we as local members should just accept policy because that's the way it is. The purpose of having elected members on planning committees like this is to represent our constituents to the best of our ability. And if we feel that something shouldn't go into a certain area for reasons that's been outlined, then that to me is, is absolutely legitimate for elected members to be carrying out that role. So I support what the, the colleagues have said, although I'm not an East Kilbride councillor, but I do support it because I know what happens, what did happen in, in my ward. So uh, that, that's just a bit of background just to, to, to some of the issues surrounding these types of application. Okay, thank you. Are there no other questions or comments on the report? No, I'll second it, Chair. Thank you. Chair. Yeah. Yeah, I've, moved, I've moved refusal. Yes. Okay, I'll second that. Okay, so we have an amendment to refuse the application proposed by Councillor Scott and seconded by Councillor Bortall and the motion to um, grant the application proposed by Councillor Dorman and seconded by Councillor Horsham. So by roll call, if you could please indicate your Preference. Chair, can I can I just uh, make a point of order? Uh, if you know, I, I, I've got no real actually grind here, but if people are uh, putting an amendment in to reject it, then there surely has to be a planning condition that uh, is valid for that objection to go forward. So uh, I would ask Councillor Scott yes. uh, to, to, to put that forward. Uh, yeah, that's a fair point. Obviously, I. On, uh, on road and traffic considerations and the general amenity of traffic volume. I mean, is that good enough, Peter? Uh, I'm not an expert. Sorry, I, 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 sorry, I would also I also add in the disturbance to the, the residents yes. in the immediate area, amenity, which is amenity a value. Yeah, yeah that's amenity value. Disturbance to amenity value in the area. Are you happy with that, Peter? Uh, it's not to me, Graham. It's, it's, <laughs> it's up to the chair. Just, I just wanted. You need the point. A, I mean, uh, it's, it's a gen, it's a genuine point. Uh, if if people are con uh, point, concerned yeah. about that, uh, there, there should be a, a good reason behind it. Well, the grounds have been added now, Peter. There we go. Let me ask Jenna. Chair, chair, can I can I make a point of order? And it's about Peter Craig's point of order. I don't see that that is a point of order. <laughs> members on this committee, or members in any committee can vote whichever way they decide. They don't have to give justifications for that. That isn't a point of order. I'm disappointed that the chair didn't stop that from becoming a point of order. Geraldine? Sorry, sorry, Chair. Um, I, I forgot to take the mute off. Um, to respond to both Councillor Craig and to the other councillors through you, Chair, um, when the Planning Committee are proposing to refuse an application against officers' recommendations, they have to state the grounds for refusal. Now, that's mainly so that we know what to put in the notice of decision and also to allow a defence to an appeal to be mounted if one should come in. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Chair, do you want me to do wording for that? Yes, please. Okay, I move referral on the grounds of road and traffic considerations in terms of traffic volume and amenity value, the effect on the amenity value of the area. Is that uh, a planning officers and Geraldine happy with that? Is that okay, Geraldine? We can address amenity value, surely. Yes. Um, so uh, through amenity, are you talking about nuisance as well, councillors? Yes. Yes, that's a general term, amenity, yeah. If you want, I can add nuisance if you want, but I mean, I think we're, we're batting an open door here. I've got to be honest, because I think it's the, the case is, is clear and, and open. So it's traffic considerations, amenity, including uh, nuisance. Yes, Thank that'll you. do me fine. OK, Stuart. Sure. OK, so as I say, the amendment is to refuse on the grounds as outlined by Councillor Scott, and the motion is to approve the application. And if you could please indicate your preference, Councillor Allison. I'll go with the local members, uh, so it'll be the amendment, please. Councillor Buchanan. Amendment. Councillor Callaghan. Motion. Councillor Cowie. Amendment. Councillor Craig. Motion. Councillor Devlin. Amendment. Councillor Donnelly. Um, amendment, actually. Councillor Dorman. Motion. Councillor Dreiber. Amendment. Councillor Hamilton. Amendment. Councillor Harrow's left the meeting. Councillor Horsham. Motion. Councillor LeBlanc. Motion. Councillor Lennon. Amendment. Councillor Lockhart. Amendment. Councillor McLaughlin. Amendment. Councillor Nalen. Amendment. Councillor Nugent. Amendment. Councillor Scott. Amendment. Councillor Thompson. Amendment. And Councillor Blotter. Amendment. OK, 15 members have voted in favour of the amendment and five members voted in favour of the motion, so I declare the amendment carried. OK, thank you, Stuart. Moving on to agenda item 11, that's the planning enforcement charter on page 153.174. And you'll take us through the item. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. The purpose of the report is to seek approval to revise the Council's planning enforcement charter. The Council has a statutory duty under the Planning Act to prepare an enforcement charter and it also must be kept under review and updated and republished at least every two years. Mm. The current version of the charter includes um, a priority system and that's to ensure officers prioritise their responses to potential breaches. So at the high priority level we have um, cases where which would include the most serious potential effects which may affect important or sensitive sites so those would include the likes of um, works that might cause uh, an immediate threat to public safety or immediate harm to the immediate of an area. 
and also where there might be damage to listed buildings or to protected trees. It, it, below that level, we've got the medium priorities, um, which require a response within five working days. And these can include ongoing building operations or the change of use of land, which are not significantly harmful to amenity, um, but still require um, a, a response. And at the, at the lower priority, uh, these are cases where the unauthorised development reported is likely to be of small scale in nature and unlikely to have a major effect on the amenity or public safety. Um, and they should be responded to within 10 working days. So the charter highlights that infor formal enforcement action will only be considered where it's in the public interest to do so, and that reflects national planning policy on enforcement. So, for example, taking action is not appropriate in order to resolve a neighbour dispute. We think the um, in general terms of priority um, cases uh, method has worked really well, and we're not intending to change that to any, any great extent. Moving then on to uh, the current situation, it, um, section 4.1 of the report, there's a table there that shows that the number of enforcement cases that have been investigated by the, by the service has increased by around 50% in the last 12 months. So a key part of the review of the current charter was to consider whether the system for prioritising enforcement cases still remains appropriate in view of that current workload. So overall, it's considered the existing hierarchy is relevant um, as there are timescales for investigating each type of priority. But we are in, in, intending to add um, anonymous complaints. Um, sorry, we did add anonymous complaints as a priority uh, last time round. That's been reviewed and it is noted in, in general terms, they relate to more minor matters that are, that are resulted from neighbour disputes or private legal matters. So given the increase in unauthorised um, works and, and inquiries about them, um, it's, it's not considered an appropriate use or efficient use of resources to continue to investigate anonymous complaints unless the alleged unauthorised works relate to a case which, which would cause a significant level of harm. So we're therefore proposing in the charter that um, we will no longer um, investigate anonymous complaints. Having said that, we will uh, consider each on its merits and if it would relate to a case that would cause significant harm, uh, we would continue to um, investigate that, that case as well. Other changes to the to the charter are fairly minor. And the main one being um, the, the new Planning Act in 2019 um, increased the penalties for non-compliance with notes served by the Council, and that's listed in 4.3 of the report. So we're, we're recommending that the amendments to the charter be um, that are set out in the report in, in the appendix are authorised and that the Head of Planning be given uh, authorisation to, uh, author to complete the Charter and, and to publish it. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, buddy. Any questions? Special Wilson? You know, just a general point. That when it comes to enforcement, you know, I would like to think that we talk about it's in the public interest. I would like to think that legal costs would not be something that would determine public interest because I, I've seen occasions in the past where applications were approved retrospectively which under no circumstances would have been approved had they gone before the planners but action is not taken in those cases and I'm pretty sure that the action was not taken because of the possibility of legal costs and that should not be a, a measure of what the public interest is. Would you like to respond? Yeah, I just respond very quickly uh, through you, Chair. I mean, we, we deal with retrospective applications in the same way as we do um, other applications. We treat on the merits. Um, we do often have the advantage of when we get to a retrospective application, we can understand what the impact is on, on an area. So they're often easier, if you like, to, to determine. But um, we, we don't treat them any differently and we certainly don't take any potential legal costs into account when, when deciding whether to... Um, take action or not. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson. Couldn't hear you, Chair. What did you say? Wasn't that nice to ask your question? Right. A um, couple of things, Tony. First of all, I can understand where you're going with uh, not investigating anonymous complaints. Um, and you've identified that you may need to release information under Freedom of Information Act 
that that could leave some complainants very exposed to fictitious action. Turn the question round, is there anything we can do to protect those people who do wish to complain um, and are frightened of consequences that may arise? And secondly, should there not be something within the Charter as to how quick we get to enforcement action? Because it seems that at the moment um, it can take months uh, of conditions not being applied to before we even consider going down that, that road, and that can cause a great deal of unrest as well. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just through you. So, in terms of keeping people's um, identities, um, we, we we generally do seek not to divulge uh, the, the identity of someone who's, who's made a complaint, because we're aware that sometimes that can lead to reprisals. Um, the, the point in the report, in terms of um, information requests, is that at some point there may be a, a time in the future that where we have to. Um, release that information. It, it's a very limited um, point, I think. Uh, and the other aspect, I suppose, as well, is if a case ever went to court, then the the expectation would be that the person who's made the complaint, who's directly affected by the, the, the unauthorised works, would be expected to um, put their case forward, I guess, and, and, and be a, a witness to give evidence. And again, though, that, that's, that's a very rare occurrence. So in answer to that question, we, we do certainly seek to not release names unless through some information request criteria that we, we would have to do that. So hopefully that gives you a bit of comfort there. In terms of how quick we we um, we, we proceed to enforce an action, and, and again, it, we always this, use this, this phrase about every case and its merits. We do try to work with applicants and developers to try and or, or um, householders to try and reach a satisfactory conclusion. Um, enforcement action is always the last resort, and, and the planning policy, uh, national planning policy, does um, does require us to, to do that. Um, but but yes, I, I fully understand where you, where you're coming from on that, um, and we will. Well, so if if we're not dealing with in, in anonymous complaints. We've had a really big glow to the shares, as I said, in terms of cases, and that has led to some delays in, in maybe progressing things as, as, as good as we can. But hopefully the, river, the, the rise charter and the priority list will allow us to direct our resources to those cases where we can perhaps take action a bit quicker. Thank you. Councillor Scott? Yeah, sorry, I think the basic answer was there. There's nothing we can actually do to protect uh, those who complain from their names coming out in public more than one suggested. Well, I think, yes. as I say, if, if an information request was made by someone who um, had been the subject of a complaint, then in, in normal circumstances, we, we do refuse to issue that. Um, the, the identity of the person who's made the complaint. To say it may be further down the line when things get close to a court action, then that might not be um, possible. But that, that's extremely rare that that, that happens, Councillor Allison. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Me now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Again, it's similar to the points that uh, Councillor Allison made on four point two about anonymous complaints no longer being investigated, and hopefully some common sense will be, be added. I take the point that there are vexatious and malevolent uh, calls to, to planning enforcement about neighbours or whatever that are not true and are just uh, troublemaking, but there's also genuine anonymous calls. Uh, the neighbour who sticks up a nine-foot fence without planning permission blocks off a, a passageway there are loads of them that uh, that people need to know that, that the council that they can make a proper complaint anonymously if they feel there is any danger to them. So hopefully, come I, I take the point about the vexatious and malevolent ones, but I do think there's common sense that if a breach of planning regulations or is uh, reported that it is properly investigated. And one final point, 
I think every councillor on this uh, meeting probably signed up a couple of years ago to remember the police campaign. If you see something, say something. I think we all signed up to that and we all support that wholly. I think we've got to give a consistent message to our constituents that if you see something that's wrong, that is a breach of the law or breach of rules, then report it. If you see something, say something. So, as I say, hopefully, I mean, Pauline can come in and give some comfort in terms that this is not throwing baby out with the bathwater, that genuine anonymous complaints will be dealt with as normal. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Pauline. Thanks, Chair. Just, just to come in and, and help Tony out. I think a lot of people are seeing things and saying something at the moment, Councillor Scott, if you look in the table at 4.1. Um, I mean, just to draw members' attention to, to the fact that we only have three enforcement officers for the whole of South Lanarkshire, and one of them is a, is a fairly new junior officer who only joined us at the start of the year and is, is while very good, is, is learning on the job and learning the patch. So with 280 complaints, I'm not right good at arithmetic, but that's more than 90 cases per enforcement officer. So you can see they do have a big caseload, and we do have to prioritise. Um, but and and every case is in its merit. So now that's going to send Councillor Scott running for the hills now that I've said that. But to give you the comfort and to give all members the com comfort, of course, if it is a serious amenity issue of the types that you've described, Councillor Scott, of course we will investigate it. Um, if it's a nine foot fence or a nine metre fence, we'll be right out there. If it's a um, 2.1 metre fence, 0.1 of a metre above the two metres, we might not run quite as, as fast. And, and a serious issue, I do think it's it's down to lockdown that our um, amount of complaints has gone up so much. I think there are two issues. I think people are doing a lot of work around their house, to their house, in their garden. And we have a lot of planning applications coming in for garage conversions, garden offices, small scale extensions. Probably some of those applicants are doing that without permission. But I also think people are at home, they're going for walks locally, they're noticing what their neighbours are doing, their Netflix subscriptions run out and they're contacting planning enforcement. So, you know, the, the serious point I'm making is we take it seriously. We do investigate within the powers that we've got, but members, we do have to prioritise. But the more se most serious issues will and always have been tackled first. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Pauline. Chair, yeah, Councillor Callahan's got her hand raised. Thank you, Stuart. Councillor Callahan. Thanks, Chair. Um, Again, on 4.2 as well, I do I do still have some concerns around that there. Um, you know, there's people that may not wish to give their name for fear of any kind of bullying and intimidation, which can sometimes go into a degree as well, and fear and reprisals there. Um, so anonymous complaints, I think, you know, I think that's something that we need to be really, really careful around. Um, I appreciate that there are um, vexatious complaints as well there, um, but also there might be situations just where, for example, um, there is a real issue and uh, people just don't want to don't want to actually damage their relationships with their neighbours, whether that's commercial or, or its residents. So I still have I still have some I still have some reservations about that. Thanks. Okay, thank you. There's another hand up here. Yeah, Councillor Lockhart. Thank you. Councillor Lockhart. Hello, this is not, um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go. I've got another meeting starting in a few minutes, so I will duck out of this. I don't think there's a vote on this one anyway, but I won't be present for the last one. OK. Thanks for letting us go. Take care. All right. Thank you. Councillor Craig. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, I'll just point out, I, I, I take on board the, the, the comments that have been made, but I'll just point out that uh, there are counsellors that people can go to uh, if they fear the, their name uh, being in, embroiled in something. So uh, we do have the ability to keep uh, keep those, those names uh, to ourselves. So there is a way around it. Uh, if people use it, that's up to them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Good point. Any other questions or comments? I'll move the report. I'll second it, Chair. Agreed. 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 
Yes, thank you. Moving on to agenda item 12, that's the tree preservation order. That's from pages 175 to 178. Another one for Tony. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. So the purpose of the report is to seek approval for the making of a tree preservation order uh, on trees that are situated between Cityford Drive in Kingsbridge Drive in Rutherglen. The trees that are subject to the Pro CPO, they relate to two areas. Um, firstly, along the dividing boundary uh, between properties in Cityford Drive and Kingsbridge Drive. And secondly, an area of the mean open space, which is bounded by Cityford Drive, Landermere Drive, Kingsbridge Drive and, Low, and Watt Low Avenue. So the, the trees in question are all considered to contribute to the character, immediate and sense of place of that locality and to the surrounding area of Rutherglen. The trees are notable um, uh, vis visually, visually by virtue of their position within the landscape. The land at the rear of City of Drive sits at a high level to the properties to the rear and the, the collective value and size of the trees sit between the properties make a significant contribution to the meaning of the area and the wider green infrastructure and network and it's considered the trees are at risk as a result of trees that have been removed and in a, in a probably tree pruning that was carried out um in the middle of last year and therefore uh, we're concerned about the, the the safety of the trees and the, and the life expectancy if further work is carried out to them um, so, in order to protect um, and to ensure that only appropriate maintenance is undertaken uh, and prevent indiscriminate removal of the trees and the retention of them, the promotion of a TPO is considered, considered necessary in this case. So, we're asking the committee to, uh, to approve two parts recommendation that a provisional tree preservation is promoted um, on the area identified on the attached plan and that the provisional tree preservation is confirmed within six months from the date of this order, should there be no objections. Thank you, Tony. Any questions or comments? Councillor Cullen? Thanks, Chair. Um, it, it's quite a general question, actually, about TPOs. I had asked quite a while back, maybe even a year ago or something there, if there's um, somewhere publicly um, where we can actually look at TPOs and see what see what trees are registered, etc. I'm wondering if that's available. Uh, yes, Councillor Dormans, yes, through you. Um, I will check it out, Councillor uh, Callahan, and let you know. Um, I don't think there's a comprehensive um, list of TPOs or, or, or a visual list. I'll certainly find out to see what we have and let you see it and, and other members. Thanks, Tony. That would be appreciated. I think as well too. You know, it's um, it leaves it open to there being a reasonable excuse for people um, to to take action, or shall we say, on trees where they really shouldn't where they really shouldn't be. Um, makes it makes it very easy for people to plead ignorance, if you like. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. Just very quickly, I'm sure my colleague uh, Councillor Len will be saying the same thing. I'm all for the protection of trees. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Len. Uh, yes, I'm kind of tempted to give an anti tree argument there just to wind uh, Councillor Thompson up. Um, no, brilliant. I just want to say I'm very much supportive of this. I was um, I was walking down um, Caldwood Road in Rutherglen, which isn't too far away from that, and it used to be lined by mature trees. And um, when I was a wee bit younger, and I was thinking about how sad it was that they've all been lost. And that's true of like quite a few of the mature trees in and around Rutherglen. So the more um, the more of a, an organised effort we can make to protect some of these trees and make it a kind of green and pleasant place going forward, um, the better. And I particularly like uh, Councillor Callan's suggestion of having a, a kind of integrated um, list and, or better even a map um, of trees that are under protection so we can identify gaps where uh, some noble trees maybe are at risk. Okay, thank you. Councillor Callan, any questions? I'll second it, Chair. Agree with the report? I can see. Agreed. Okay. Thank you all very much for your time today and I don't have any other urgent business, so I'd like to close the meeting and again thank you. 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 Thank